boys. Are we rolling? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Bust with the Boys, episode 198. Yes. 198, which you know what that means. We're, we're right around the corner to 200. Have you noticed the last three weeks we've had over 100,000 views on YouTube? I think 100 million, right? There's just a, that, the yeah, YouTube yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. The, the, just, what people are seeing right now. What people are seeing. Which, if you're watching, please subscribe to the boys. Drop the thumbs up. Drop the comments. Have fun in the comment section. Because it's a big deal, boys. It's a big 2023. And we haven't really started cooking yet, dude. We're, by, we're getting the ingredients for this fire 2023 season. But you guys just know. You guys just know what's about to happen. So you're subscribing, you're unsubscribing, you're resubscribing, we're watching the views. The formula, putting a little strong strength, dependability, mm -hmm. some grit, some determination. Oh, dude, what a perfect segue into our presenting sponsor, Chevy Silverado. Well, the playoffs are upon us, but one team has already won it all. That team is Chevy and its star player, the Silverado, a truck with unstoppable grit mm. and determination, mm -hmm. just like that seasoning we use on this sauce on this episode and every episode to come. According to J.D. Power, Chevy trucks have earned more new vehicle quality awards than any other brand. That is some serious hardware. Head over to Chevy.com to learn more. Silverado, as strong and dependable as the people who drive them. For J.D. Power 2022 U.S. award information, visit JDPower.com slash awards. Our show is progressing. Like your ad reading. Buddy, I appreciate you, you know saying I mean? that. The th biggest thing that changed for me on the ad reading is when I said, I'm getting better at reading, and you go, brother, like, you just doing it now. Yeah, well, that you, was, said, you said, oh, I'm bad at reading. Yeah, yeah, and that's I'm the motivation I needed. Yeah. The motivation I needed, and there's motivation this weekend, boys. The boys took ourselves on a four-hour, 20-minute flight at, what, 6 a.m., a 6.10 departure flight mm. to Las Vegas, Nevada, dude where dreams are either made or broken. Now, it almost got bad quick in a hurry. The day before we do a podcast, we're not going to say who, because that's going to come out in about two weeks. It's going to be amazing. You guys are all going to enjoy it. I'm sure that'll do big numbies. Yeah. Because you guys are putting up big numbies for us. But I asked Will, as he's leaving the bus, I say, hey, what fly do you want? Because Will was thinking about taking the one o'clock flight or that 6 a.m. flight with me and the boys as we ventured off into Vegas with hopes and dreams. He goes, oh, man, I'm probably going to take that afternoon flight. So I pull out my figurative journal and my figurative pen. I take a note. I'm going to remember that, boss. I'm going to remember that. Nothing else was said. I'm packing that night. I'm having a great time. I look, I'm putting all my stuff together, getting a couple fire fits together. And I can't even sleep because it's the old line trip and I can't wait. Not only is it old line trip, but we went to Vegas to also shoot a couple of pods that are going to be equally as fire awesome. as that yeah, 200 those pieces. Gonna awesome. Those are going to be amazing. It is 532. I'm sitting, I'm at my gate. The, we board in 18 minutes. I get a phone call from Will Compton. I think, what's this man doing up this early? Huh? Is he fighting Jocko again? Like, what's going on with my boy? Because when Terry took out his little imagination notebook and pen mm. and stuff, I was like, oh, I got him right where I wanted him. Right where, you, right where you wanted me. And I didn't know. I answer the phone and Buddy sounds out of breath. Like he's been running. He's just in the truck driving. What are you going? How fast are you going? Speed limit. The speed limit. Plus five, right? Yeah, you're on the speed limit. Speed limit. So why don't you go ahead and break down what happened that evening, that morning? Yeah, so basically I set my alarm for four. For whatever reason, the boy doesn't hear it. And I guess, and you know when you're, what what's surprising to me is the iPhone, it's going off, right? But I'm never like, you got to touch the stop down at the bottom of the screen. All you got to do is grab and like touch one of the side buttons and it, it snoozes the alarm. Mm. I don't know how I turned it off, but I turned it off. And the next thing I know, JP's calling me at 530 in the morning because we're supposed to meet at the bus at five. Now, that is, it's all, it, it's obviously all on me, but I was curious, like, why, why well, wasn't I getting on you and a little bit on Apple? Correct. Yeah. And a little bit on JP and Mitch. I feel like right. because, so you thinking, because if, you, if we're supposed to meet at five and it's 505, like I'm thinking, okay, you got to call at some point, you would but, think you, so. but you wait, you wait 30 minutes to give the boy a phone call. Now into the absolute panic, JP, oh, well, you, maybe, maybe Mitch, you, you, guys, maybe you, you guys, yourself. you guys thought hypotheticals on, he could be doing this. He could be doing that either way. 30 minutes went by. Um, the panic for whatever reason, JP's calling me and I hear the vibration of the phone call. Wake up to that. <clears throat> Try to keep it like, um, hey, what's up, JP? And he was like, hey, do you want to just meet at the airport? Pull it back. See, 530 on my phone. Oh, Absolute panic. Flight anxiety. takes off at 620. I'm like, you know, 
Charles starts hearing panic. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, we get off the phone. Charles starts hearing panic. She's like, what's going on? I'm like, flight leaves in 50 minutes. I'm not making it. It's over. Like, I'm not making it. And kind of just stood there and like kind of put my head down like, I ain't making this. And she's like, you can make it. You can make it. What time is it? And she's like, what do you need me to help you to do? And I'm like, you know, I'm scatterbrained. I'm fucking shit hit the fan and I'm not responding the right way at right, first. Right, right. Fortunately, everything was basically packed. I just had to throw a couple things on and uh, hit the road. I hit the road. And, you know, as you guys know, I'm going the speed limit. But I called Taylor. And uh, Taylor asked me, like, what are you doing up this early? That's like the first thing he says, kind of with a smile. Kind of like, okay, what's you happening? You smiling. Yeah. You can feel the rays in my yeah, cheeks. Yeah, yeah. On the oh, phone. what's going on? I said, I got good news and bad news. And he's like, tell me the bad news. And I was like, bad news is I just woke up. The good news is I'm supposed to be on that flight at 620. Which fires me up, dude. Yeah. I'm like, oh, fuck. But then it sets in. Like, I look at my phone. I pull, I do the pullback, and I look at it. I'm like, damn. Yeah. He ain't going to make yeah. this. Yeah, because I'm going to walk up. I'm going to roll up and be the hero. You know what I mean? I'm going to see Taylor's reaction. 100%. Bump with the boys yeah. yelling, excitement Big from Vegas. Dap up city. Yeah, but I'm thinking there's no fucking way, dude. End up pulling the shit off. Pulls make the it shit there. off. While the, a, while the A-list is going, still make it. It's like the back half of the A-list. And then see the boys. We get on the flight, but I'm I'm in a full sweat. My back and ass are already sweating. They sweat the entire flight, four-hour flight. We got a mammoth, two seats over right from us, just snoring their ass off. Oh, um, yeah, in your aisle. Yeah, yeah, in Ripping aisle, up, dude. Ripping. Sawing logs like crazy, but even before that, dude. Yeah, there's a bit of a deal on the plane. This flight was, it started off with a lot of adversity. Thankfully, I answered the call. Well, I don't know. If, we'll see. We'll determine, you guys can determine whether I answered this call or not, because I can see where I might have went wrong a little bit. Right. But at first, it started because I, I get on the plane and, and the, uh, what, are, what are they called? The airline assistant. Flight attendants? People, flight attendants. Um, you can tell she's in a mood like, oh, we got a group of fucking yeah. dudes going to Vegas. She's like, got a resting bitch face on. Yeah, yeah. Which she's good for her, dude. It's Nashville at 6 a.m. Yeah. We're going to Vegas. Early, we're, yeah, we're bringing different vibes. I'm like, should I sit here? Should I sit there? I like go over to sit next to Ben Jones and realize like he's too big. I don't want to sit next to him. So I'm going to go sit in another seat. Mitch gets in the middle next to me. Um, and I like lean back and I'm like talking with the boys. I think I just say shit. You say but shit. come to find out, it's like, that's fucking bullshit is what I ended up saying. Oh, I, thought I, I thought I basically just said, oh, like something, something shit. And she literally goes, watch your mouth. And I'm thinking... Jesus Christ, like, what's up her ass? <laughs> yeah. Come to find out later, Corey was like, bro, bro, you said, like, dude, it was fucking bullshit. Yeah, he, <laughs> and he was, okay, he, okay, he okay. was loud about it. Yeah, yeah, now yeah. that might, we, I wish we'd do the progressive, like, pull the red challenge flag on that, because I don't know if you said fucking bullshit. I think you just said I shit. would love to see the tape. Yeah. But if that's true, like, okay, I get it. Right. You know, there's probably kids around. I'm like, oh, that's fucking, I'm just hyped for the boys. Yeah, and everyone plays the same game when they get on a Southwest flight. If you're lucky enough to have, like, that A1 through 30, if you're able to sit in that beginning little section, you think, and you're with a buddy, hey, let's sit here. We'll try to make ourselves as big as possible. Yeah. Put some shit in the middle of the seat. If you put the head down, give yourself like you're fucking, like you might be mad at the world. Like you might be a bit of a loose cannon. I don't want to sit next to that <laughs> yeah, guy. Right, 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 right. So I'm sitting next to. They're saying full flight, but you know there are a couple stragglers and they might There's not make it. So stragglers. you're trying to like have early that flight too. Yeah. You think all oh, people are going to miss this yeah, flight? Yeah, like me. I, I was sitting next to Corey. Yeah, Corey was in the window seat. I was in the aisle seat. We don't do too much. We don't get too elaborate. I take my tickets. I had a paper ticket for whatever reason. When I put my bag down, they said, do you want a ticket? I said, no, I'm good. They're like, hey, you get a free drink coupon. You might want to take the ticket. So I take the ticket. I said, we both have our tickets. We put our tickets in the middle. That's really it. Then we're talking. We're doing the close talking like the aisles here, but we're both. We're in the lean like up. This. Yeah, you're leaning Mitch up. Mitch comes. I'm trying to tell the Mitch to go back there. Right. I was like, no, no, sit in the middle. Sit in the middle next yeah. to Will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm so like, this, right. and this lady is sitting. I'm in the exit row. She is sitting in the exit row right next to me, kind of watching all this shit go down. And obviously, I wasn't realizing at the time, but was not enjoying my process of trying to save my seat. So while people are starting to come in, the flight is getting fuller, but it's really, we're not at a point of panic yet. We're not really in the crunch time of the game where you're going to find out, like, are you catching this W? You're catching this L? We're going to find out. Well, we have the two tickets up there, and I'm kind of, we're playing chess with everybody else on board. You've got, you guys have gotten that part of the story. What I don't realize is this flight attendant seeing me and thinking to herself that she needs to be the vigilante to stop this entire process from happening. So what happens she's is... Trying to get up, she's trying to get one up on all the boys. She's trying to get one up on us. She realizes that, okay, she's identified us as the group going to yeah. Vegas, the ones that are a little too excited that early in the morning, yeah. and she wants to put out that fire Big, quick. obnoxious, loud, they're yeah. cussing. Right, and there's a whole bunch of us. We're talking. I'm leaning forward. I'm looking to the right. I'm leaning to my back. Like, there's a whole bunch of talking, a lot of, a lot of head movement yeah. going on. She leans over to me and says, sir, can you uh, move those tickets out of the way so somebody can sit there? I'm thinking, bro, these are some fucking tickets. Like, well, and I go, yeah, no problem. So I take the tickets. 
and I put him in there. What else I, you say? And I you say said, to her, yeah, you said some more. I, say, than just I, look, I look at her and I go, I can understand why that's a huge problem. I'll make sure and move those out of the way. <laughs> and, uh, like, and they're little there. fucking four little tickets. And so I have, that's probably the first point in which I could have handled myself a little bit different. For sure. Ate that. Yes, ma'am. No problem. Her, Hit it with a yes, ma'am and move on. If you're her, you're like, all right, bet. Yeah. Yeah. And she, the, yeah. she dialed that in. Now, what happens after this? She did do a little bit more. Let's let you Didn't you say something else story. too? Well, we'll find out at the end of the story, Willie. We will find out at the end of the story. As people are coming down, this heavy set black gentleman is walking down the aisle. She points. She goes, sir, they're starting to fill up in the back. Why don't you just go ahead and sit right here? Why don't you just go and sit in this seat right here? Looking in between me and Corey, looking through me into the seat. Go, sir, why don't you just go ahead? This seat's, this seat's open right here. Go ahead. I take a quick peek back, right? I catch my six. I look back. Ben Jones is doing the big elbows, and he's got he's in that two seat piece in the exit row. Mm-hmm. There's the two seat because that third seat's missing, so that last row behind it, that person has a lot of leg room. Nick Petit Ferrer took that; he's a rookie. Is that okay for him to do? I wouldn't say that, but I'm not a guy to say, "Hey, rookie, get up, let me sit there." Instead, I let him have it. He wanted it; he got it. That is the way the game is played. He won that battle. And I'm looking around like, bro there's like three more aisles behind me with not only middle seats, but aisle seats as well. Fucking aisle seats are in this thing. Mm -hmm. People start to fill in. Everybody sits down. She goes to leave. She is now walking out of the row right next to me. She's walking out and I could have done nothing, but I look up at her. I go, Hey, I really appreciate you facilitating that. Thank God we got that done. She fucking looks at me, oh, bro. You do got three big dudes, three big dudes in that yeah. row. In that row, bro. And it, I'll get in more of the flight because there was some shenanigans that went down later. Well, it is 12 minutes in, like, you know. Yeah, yeah. She fucking points at me. She goes, sir, come here. Gives me the finger, puts it in my face like this and goes, come here. Come with me to the back of the plane. My first thought was, bet, we're going to the back of the plane, not the front of the plane. I'm not trying to get kicked off this flight. She takes me to the back of the plane and basically is like, why are you being an asshole? And I was like, oh, I, I, I was just kind of given what I was getting. Like I, I, and then I fucking did what every person should in this situation. Did she say, are we going to have a problem? She said, flight? are we going to have a problem? She goes, are we going to have a problem? No. And I tell her, I was just going to, I was just giving what I was getting, blah, blah, blah. standing by the bathrooms in the I'm back? standing behind yeah. the bathrooms in the little. She took you on yeah. the walk. Yeah, she yeah. took me on a walk. She, she took, took him on a walk. walk. Yes. We're all giggling like he just got called to the principal's office. Yeah. That's exactly how I'm imagining Bro. it. Yeah. I fucking, I did what any individual should do in that situation. I tucked that fucking tail so far between my legs. Like it was tucking my, it was touching my fucking belly button. I apologized to her. I said, I'm really sorry. And then she realizes that I am retracting everything. I am moving back. I have literally waved that white flag and the game is over for me. She is now turning her personality into, hey, listen, I'm from Chicago. I have a dry sense of humor too. Mm-hmm. I think to myself. That ain't dry. That's just you, just mad. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you were just you were mad at me for whatever reason. She didn't like our group from the get go. From the get go, she made a decision about us. Now the rest of the flight, sweetheart, the, sweetheart. During it, she says, "I haven't got my coffee yet." I see her about an hour later during the flight. And I go, "Did you get your coffee?" She smiles at me and says, "Yes." Every time she walks by, she's giving me a little extra attention. Hey, can I get you another coffee? Are you all right? Get, laughs at my bad jokes and she moves on. Mm-hmm. So we got through the flight well. I the guy sitting next to me. He was chicken pecking his way through South America, dude. He was just bobbing and weaving the whole fucking. The Corey ends up putting his arm around him. They end up like yeah. We had a little, we have a little photo. I will send you guys a photo so we, we can put it up on the YouTube. But um, I go to the bathroom at one point. That motherfucker had all of my aisle. Like I was in that corner like this, dude, sitting for like an hour and a half. Like it was tough. But we get to Vegas, and I feel like Willie should take a little bit more of that because I have been talking for a long time. Well, I'm just saying we we, we should probably pace because we still got to cover the I NFL. Really we got to Vegas yet? That's what, that's what I'm know. saying. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Once you start going into the hole, I was like, oh, we're we're going details. We're Vegas, going details. Vegas was an incredible time. We had an amazing. Some guys won, some guys lost, and some guys in between. There were a couple of big losers. Three uh, grand this weekend. Three grand. Yeah. Yeah, Willie. Good fucking shit. Run dude. the ball. Run the ball. I'm not gonna say what I lost. It's not important. What I did do is I won in friendship. I had a great weekend with my buddies. But yes, the first day, bro. We get to the we get to the hotel probably what nine o'clock. Yeah, nine fifteen. Later. Nine fifteen. We're gambling early. Gambling fast, often early. Drinking. Drinking all of it. We get in a little high limits room just because the big dogs aren't there for the weekend yet. They moved the minimum down to like one hundred dollars a hand by the weekend. They're saying there's $5 million buy-ins and the minimums on the table were like five grand. Right. But we find ourselves a nice little corner and we get a little, 
that we're flowing. The energy's high. High. We realize we want to take a break, go upstairs. Like, we'll you stay know. a cigar down at 3 p.m. Yeah. Yeah. Cigar down okay, early. Throwing that thing around, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pointing at the fucking guy. We're go, chanting, go, going rally hats, just yeah, fucking all the language a, and terminology. You know, the high point of the weekend, for but sure. But we want to go upstairs for, I guess, just to take a break and wait for somebody else to Got get there. Maybe lunch. I don't know. Hit yeah, a power hour. Lunch, yep. Yeah, yeah. Power hour. Yeah. yeah. And like, hey, let's play this game. Lucy. AC Ducey. AC Ducey. AC Ducey, bro. Explain the, pre and quickly explain the details of the game. It's a very simple game. All right. So AC, AC Ducey, say, Jack, we are playing. And we put in a $100 minimum. That's what the minimum was, $100. So we're throwing in $100. You put in, you, you face up one card, face up another card. Say it's a four and a Jack. You either want to hit and play the game, meaning you're thinking the next card out of my hand is going to be in between a four and a jack. If you're like, you would say pot, meaning you're betting what's in the pot. You would say pot, I flip up the card. If you're within the, the jack and the four, you win the pot. If you're outside of the jack and four, just outside of it, not jack or four, outside of those two cards, you lose you would just, you would have to pay whatever you what, bet. Yeah. If you bet the pot, you have to pay what's in the pot. So if it's $500 in the pot, you got to pay $500 in the pot. If you post, meaning you hit the jack or the four, you have to double the pot. I learned very quickly that this is not going to be the game that I want to partake in. I think after three hands, I was like, first two hands, it doesn't even get around to me. I don't even get to guess. Right? Like right. somebody either wins or somebody won right away. And I'm like, oh, I just lost. I just lose my money. Gone. And the next time I got to go, it was like, I got like a nine and a seven. So I didn't get to actually, I was like, skip. Because if you don't want to bet, you just say skip. Money stays in. It just goes to the next person. So, bro, these hands were massive. I'm talking stereotypical. You want an idea of NFL players gambling up in a hotel room? Yeah. This is it. Bro, you could literally, there was so much money on the table at one point, you could buy, pay in full a 2023 Honda Civic. Yeah, there was a Honda Civic on the table of money. Now, when it stopped, when there's there's stuff in between that we can hit on too, because Taylor, there was a big one where I'm big like, one, I'm telling Taylor, one. and I'm like, no. Right, because it was, I, was, I think the number was at 11,000 at that point. Half. Okay, 10, 10 and a half. half was it well, in cash in the fucking middle of the table. Standing there. And I'm getting nervous. And you can see, it's one of those things where if you lose your money, you're not losing it to you're you're not losing it to the casino where it's like, fuck, I bet 10 grand and I lost it. Like right. that's all on you for betting that kind of money. You see your money go to your boy's hand, and you're just trying to like the guys are trying to barter with each other, like trying to like, hey, help me out, blah, blah, blah. You can see it's like getting, I'm sweating. And uh there's 10 and a half in the middle. And Taylor goes around, I'm telling Taylor, I go, hey, brother. I go, even if it's an ace two, you shouldn't do it. And as he's saying that to me, it's my turn. And what pops up, boys? Ace, ace two. two. But he's, he's kind of making sense. I know, but if it happens, he's like, we won't know if until it actually gets there. But I'm like, just the chances of an ace two hitting. Because ace high, too low. Like, you're, all, you're not guaranteed. Your favor. The odds are very much in your favor. So, Taylor comes around. What shows? An ace and a two. And I'm like, or $10,500 on and the table. I'm like... Four cards left now, in the deck. I did not know that at first. Because <coughs> right away I go pot. And we goes, whoa, 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 whoa. Just wait. Did a you second, say pot? Brother. Yes. I go, fuck it, pot. Yeah. And I, I was, was like, no, 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 no. Just wait. I was like, I cannot. Like, I was like, Taylor, what if an ace or two happens? You have to pay not only the pot, because you can't just miss. You, you either post. You're 20, paying $21,000 yeah. to the middle. 21. 21. 21 grand. So, I would have to put 21 extra grand in there. Right. 10 and a half times two, 21 grand. He would have to put 21 grand if he happened to post. I'm like, I get that the odds are really in your favor, but if for whatever fucking reason it's an ace or two, you got to spend 21 grand. It's the afternoon on day one. Day one. Like it's 1 p.m. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's fucking 1 p.m. outside. And I told Taylor, I'm like, if you want to do it, like everybody's kind of like, you know, you, you don't have to say pot. You can say, I'll bet a thousand to the, towards the pot. So if you win, you only win a thousand. If you lose, you pay a thousand or 2000. Yeah. If you, if you post, I, Will and I are legit. Now Will has taken me like a parent, parental figure and brought me over to the corner of the room to give me a stern conversation about what could and could not happen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, I, the second walk I got that, yeah, day, yeah, yeah. I got taken for a walk by Will. It, Will goes, bro. 
has, says the whole conversation he just said to me, I look over, I go, hey, how many cards are left? They said four. Now, while everyone's arguing, because everyone is, once this money is getting this high, everyone's <sighs> arguing about what I should do in this situation. While people are arguing, I do the, th the number one thing you shouldn't do when you're playing cards. And Taylor tried looking for I started stack. moving the cards out of the way to see how many aces, how many twos I can see. I saw one ace and one two. So four cards. But right when he touches, everybody's kind of like, oh, oh. I mean, yeah. I'm like, hey, you can't do that. Like, I, that. I'm on Taylor's side, but I'm like, you can't, you I can't know, do that. I know, and that is fair. Yeah, that, yeah, is, yeah. that is a fair thing you did. But I really, in that position, it was like, I don't give a fuck how people view me. I need to make sure I'm Bro, straight. like, but that's how high the emo, that's how high this right. game was getting. So, and it's like, what do you have there? And like, yeah. let's just say Taylor had like five grand. He's like, you could do half of that, just bet it. So then if you lose, you just pay what you have available. Because some people are having to start you get to where it's like, it's not even there. The money, the cash isn't even there anymore. You got a Venmo at this point. Right. You, or it's yeah. digital. It's in the air. It's and in so, the cloud. So Taylor ends up betting it. What flips over a two? A two. A two. A fucking two. And I'm like, bro, fortunately he had whatever he had bet at that so moment. I, I, so all my money was now. And all of his money was uh, gone. All my, all, my cash, cash was gone. His cash to I play had, with for I, the weekend yeah, was I had gone. other ways of getting, uh, getting money with the casino. So I, I was like, all right, we'll be all right. And then, uh, a big one on like a king three. Wait, hey, let's not say too many names now. Pot gets up to seventeen thousand dollars, and someone pots it because it was a uh, ace three, ace uh, four. I think it was king three. King I think it was three. a king three. And Something big. Someone like, pots it. It hits a you know it posts a so three or a king thirty two or thirty four grand to the middle. That's when everybody was kind of like, all right, this has gotten out of hand. We should figure out a way to stop this. Right. So people ended up kind of getting some of their money. People got most of their money back, and whoever played the best game got a little bit more on top. But Which I'm I telling thought it was you, bullshit. But that's not, we're not even worth. It's not even worth going into right now. Yeah, you got your, you got your, you got. I cash got my back. money back. Yeah. I got. I basically got my money back, which I'm yeah. very grateful for. So, uh, but that was fucking nuts, bro. Yeah. I'm talking, and I'm sitting there looking at like JP and Mitch. Like I don't even know what these guys are thinking. They're thinking. They're thinking all their things that they could probably do and buy and live for like years off of. Yeah, at one point, Mitch goes, hey, that's a year's worth of rent just sitting there right now. Yeah. Yes, crazy. Were you about to say that? Yeah, I was like, that's five months rent. That's five months rent just <laughs> yeah. on the table, and you guys are just throwing it around like it's nothing. And I'm, Yeah, it's I'm, scary. I was sweating for you guys, and I was had nothing to do with what was going on. It, right? it was wild, it was, bro. It was the most money I've ever seen in my entire life. Yeah, we uh, we were down on the tables once, and we asked this, the dealer like, "What's the most money you've seen lost in one of these and in she blackjack?" Says this casually, she says, eighty-seven million dollars on one hand of blackjack. One hand, and she says also the highest I've ever seen one was the same guy in the same sitting, a hundred and twenty-seven million. It's like, bro, how do you, how do you fucking? And I hope she was lying for theatrical purposes. Like, Loki, she think maybe the story will get but out. Think now about we're talking billionaires the story. that are out there. That I know. Just, That's nothing to them. That would be nothing. That's what's crazy about the whole thing. Uh, crazy, dude. That night, things went really well. This gentleman named Marty in the high roller table, he was leaving. We've had plenty of drinks by this point. We're hugging Marty, and his juju in, in that hug gave us... We <laughs> we got a dub night one at, at the Aria. Yeah. We got a big dub. It was All like of us. Everybody won and... big, except for one individual who we will not name at this point. They lost pretty bad. Yeah. But it was an incredible It was an incredible time. The next few days, we did pods. It was amazing. Pods were... 10 out of 10. I, I cannot it was wait for Maybe the best listen. pods Will and I have facilitated. Yeah. We, I think we both did a, a, a very good job. Yeah, I think, it, yeah, it was fucking, they were awesome. I can't yeah. wait for you guys to hear them. They're going to be awesome. Now, <coughs> I get home Sunday. Obviously, the Saturday game's already played. Jacksonville lost. We, I mean, we all kind of thought that could happen. They put up a good fight. They had a phenomenal season. I'm sure Jacksonville is on the up and up. A lot of people are using the phrase changing of the guard in the AFC South for the Jacksonville Jaguars. I hope that's not true because obviously your boy's a Titan for life. But at the same time, like if that is like, if I'm a, if I'm a Duval fan, I am extremely happy about all the turmoil that they have gone through and now are Trevor in a Lawrence is starting to play. He's starting to play ball. He's starting to, he's starting yeah, to play he's ball. He's starting to come to life. They lose who, what's the night game? Was it Eagles, Giants? I mean, I thought Jalen Hurts would be a little rusty coming off being injured and stuff like that, but they fucking... <laughs> I forgot how good the Eagles were. without asking. Yeah, I forgot how good the Eagles were. It's like, 
they are dominant. They are like the, that in the, in the trenches. You legit really did forget who they were, right? Like as far as how good they are across the board. They didn't have it. I don't think they really had the primetime games like that. Or if they did, it was like Jalen wasn't in. It was Gardner Minshew, and then they had the bye week, so you kind of again kind of forget for a second. And then you're like, are they going to seem like the Baltimore Ravens in 2019 coming off the bye week? But bro, they are fucking juggernauts, dude. The Niners are going to have their hands full. Big time, especially after the way they played the Cowboys, because I don't Cowboys didn't play that well. Um, no, they didn't. But I would say the like we said this before in the last pod, the Eagles and the Niners are the two best put together teams in the NFL. And I think, but I think the big difference is going to be the quarterback. I think that's going to be a big difference. And I hate. Yeah. I don't know if you want to put out who's going to win that now, but I'm re- ready to say mine. Yeah, I think it's going to be tough, man. I think it's going to be hard. I'm going back and forth just because we got bet the bus this week. And I'm really like, I've said Niners are winning the Super Bowl for the last couple of weeks now. And after watching this past weekend, it's like, fuck, the Eagles are tough. They're tough, tough bro. Bet the really, bus is going to be dicey, too, with only two games on the board. Right, two games on the board and probably double the money then. So. Two, bro, because we went two and two, I think, on the, if you're just going by games, like I was... Uh, the parlay, parlays fucking just kill me, dude. I chase them all. <laughs> I chase all the parlays. Let me just have one more leg here. <laughs> oh, that looks good. <laughs> and you were saying all conservative bets you made this weekend. Do what? So a couple of your parlays were very conservative. Like, oh, these, you even put the meter down to the yeah, point. And everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like moved the line on. I just did like the Niners money line. I did the over under. I moved it down like 40. And the Niners have scored 24 points and they fucking, <laughs> they don't do it. Right. They don't do it. And, and again, I feel like they just missed. I was like, dude, the situational awareness by the Dallas Cowboys. Both teams, honestly, were playing really bad ball at the end of the game. Yeah, because who, who was it? Mitchell? Mitchell. Mitchell gets a first down and runs out of bounds. Like, bro, you have to make a hard left turn in that situation and just go down. Yeah. You don't need yards at that point. You, you need to suck up time. I was wanting a touchdown because they were at 19 points. I wanted somebody to break one and get up. Yeah, to, yeah. Get uh, up a over classic Derrick Henry yeah. runaway yeah, four yeah, minute. Yeah. Exactly. And that, like... Really, if I'm I'm Ezekiel Elliott, I am blaming Mitchell for that. Because if they would have done that, the game would have been over. And they would have never been in that position to do that dumbass play they did before. Bro, how about that last play of the game? Like, what were you thinking? I was thinking everybody has this play. Everybody has, like, we used to call it um, Cheetah when Kesin, Ken Wisenhunt was in, where you would literally be like, all the offense linemen off the field, except for the center, because the center would snap the ball. And then it is basically just playing backyard football, lateral passes only, hoping to God. Like, it's... It's your Hail Mary attempt when you're at a Hail Mary range. Now, what did you think when you saw Schultz Zeke? Guy, uh, when I saw Zeke do that, I, 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 I legit just felt bad for him. Hands were outside. He had not a lot of knee bend. Like, that's bad. You know, Zeke's out ball. There, you know, Zeke's out there thinking, this is going to be fucking horrendous. No. I, I think the, uh, the opposite. I think when they put that play in, probably week two of the season, maybe even during camp when you're going over, going over situational stuff in, on Saturdays, Zeke gets like, hey, Zeke, you're going to snap. And he's probably bragging to the boys like, man, I watched this shit. As they, and he's snapping and it's hitting Dak right in the chest. He goes, man, anybody can do this. Like he's literally probably bragging to guys. Now, situation comes up and my man gets his hands put, hands put on him. I saw that happen. I go, this place fucking dead. The minute I saw Zeke started stumbling to the ground, I go, this is, it's over. And then Dak throws the ball. Like a little like buddy. Slant route, basically. Yeah, he throws a fucking muffin to Buddy and he gets his ass fucking smacked. I'm like, what a stupid fucking play. Integrated. Yes. The, the only worst play I've ever seen in that is Indianapolis Colts on that, on that uh, fake punt. But, yeah, against the Patriots. Now, Pat McAfee has come out and said they weren't supposed to snap the ball in that situation. If we're going to believe Pat in that type of situation, then that is the worst football play I've ever seen. That shit is that shit was so embarrassingly terrible. And I can't imagine the hate right now. I know um, Stephen A. Smith, him and his hairline were fucking laughing their ass off at Dak Prescott because they they hate the Cowboys, him and his hair. It's like basically like people are saying like a legacy game. Like, yeah. You know, how's that going to... And how's they that kept saying it on the broadcast. They're like, hey, things are shaping up exactly like last year's game. Things are shaping up for Dak Prescott to have his statement game that he's going to do X, Y, and Z. And he just couldn't put it together. I can't play quarterback, so I, I, I have no room to throw shade, but the shit looked bad. Yeah. And also, another person to blame is that fucking tight end. Schultz. Casually catching the ball and just stepping out. Buddy, this ain't college. You had to put both of them little boys in the, in the ground before you hit the white paint. You try to make sure you get four steps in. Like, don't, you don't four just think, in. oh, I got yeah. this, and then casually catch the, it. Oh, yeah, just go to the ground. Put them bitches in and fucking and fall And then the, the clock side. kept running because he 
Loki was casually going out of bounds, got yeah. hit, and then just kind of walked versus like fighting yeah. forward to get out and of bounds. And then Brock Purdy had another bad play too uh, at the end of half. Was it the end of half or the? Uh, was it? I, I can't really remember, but I remember it was like oh, yeah, it, was it was the end of half, and there was like eight seconds left, and he looks and look and goes to his like third third or fourth read. It's like, well, bro, you gotta get that fucker out of there. Yeah, yeah before he so throws you have it enough out of time. They almost they almost lost that. I mean. Big work day for uh, for Madden uh, ratings people. Yeah, you big gotta bring work day. So you got to bring the awareness. Like big fucking day. You got to bring him. those awareness ratings down on some of those guys. That shit is bad, bro. The Schultz, that was that's just really bad ball. Mitchell, it was a mistake that a lot of people have made in the past. But you would think Kyle Shanahan goes over that shit every single week. And you got to know four minute, like no penalties. If you there's no holding in four minute. Like if you hold, you get beat for a TFL. That's better than a hold. There's no penalty, stay in bounds. And if you're injured, unless it's like broken, you have to get off the field. Yeah, like unless you're dying, you right. have to get off the field. And that happened in two minutes for the Cowboys as well. They're going into half and they were throwing the ball and Pollard gets a high ankle sprain. A high ankle sprain's hurt. I've had them. That shit sucks. But you got to hobble your way off that field to keep that the clock running. Or, uh, I'm sorry, you have to hobble off the field so they can either clock it or go because they had to burn a timeout in that situation. Yeah, so that's just that's just tough. That is a tough, tough deal. What? Then, uh, then you go to the what's up? No, go ahead. I was gonna say then you go to the AFC, the Bills, Bengals. Yeah, Joe Burrow's fucking. I, I don't know why I always feel like I end up just not thinking about the Bengals, but the last couple of years now, like Joe Burrow is the fucking man, bro. And it's sad. It's it's sad if you're a Josh Allen fan because before this season, in the middle of the season, it was Patrick Mahomes. Josh Allen, 1A, 1B. Like, those are the two dudes in the AFC, and every, everyone's kind of like, hey, Joe Burrow is a fucking stud. Like, don't get it twisted. My man can sling that thing. He can rip that thing. He can rip that thing all over the yard. The only situation is, is like, these are these these are the two studs. It is what it is. Josh ends up declining late in the season. A lot of turnovers. He wasn't thrown as well. He's got an elite skill set that a lot of guys don't have using his legs in certain situations. But now, after the game yesterday... You kind of sit there, and if you were to go one, two, three right now, it's Mahomes, Burrow, Allen. If you're going to rank those quarterbacks, just based off of this last mm -hmm. game. My question is, do you think Joe Burrow becomes number one if he gets a Super Bowl this year? It's hard to say. I mean, I, yes. Right? Mahomes has only got one? I would think so. He went to the Super Bowl the last two years, and if he wins it this year? Yeah, but the argument is, is uh, Mahomes has been in the Super Bowl, it seems like, every year. And I know that's a skewed number, right? They've lost the AFC Championship. They've lost in the Super Bowl, but I feel like but if they just Joe, fucking got if that Joe shit. wins this weekend, he will have beat the Chiefs the last four games in a row. Four games in a row. And I honestly believe with a with a Patrick Mahomes ankle, you got to lean towards the Bengals. I think the Bengals are winning it. I think the Bengals are winning this yeah. weekend because I really think, like, I know Pat's going to be a badass and be out there and play or do everything possible to play. Yeah. But I just think coming off of a, a high ankle sprain, I mean, you— you know how high ankle sprains are. Some guys might mess up to six weeks with a high it's ankle awful, sprain. Dude. High ankle sprains suck. And you can only, like, you legit make it worse if you play on yeah. it. Yeah. Like, he he played on it because you got the adrenaline going. You know, he took a tour all shot yeah. in the locker room. Like, you you're doing today? all these things. Yeah. The, the next two days, bro, you probably feel like your leg is broken with the high ankle sprain. He's probably in a boot right now. Yeah. He's probably in a boot right now, and he still grimaces when he walks in a boot. Thinking to myself, how in the fuck am I about to make this happen this week? Right. Now, you know, he's going to do anything possible You're to get there. shoot that shit out. That thing's going to be taped to the nines. He is going to do whatever it takes. Now, on the flip side of saying Joe Burrow, if he wins, he's like the number one quarterback. If Pat Mahomes takes his team to the Super Bowl and wins the Super Bowl with that ankle. Mm, go. Go. Oh, this I generation's just, go. Just, just throw that around just, so Yeah, loosely. you just fucking go, threw that go. to the win real yeah. fast, buddy. <laughs> but this generation's quarterbacks, which are an incredible group of quarterbacks, yeah. right? The three we've already mentioned, Lamar Jackson's Trevor in there. Trevor Lawrence coming. Trevor Lawrence is now coming along. Like, there is a crazy amount of talent at the quarterback position in the NFL right now at a very young age. He goes and takes them boys to the Super Bowl and wins the Super Bowl. On that ankle, yeah. He is goaded to that generation. Of that generation. Of that generation, dude. Yeah. He I would is, agree with that. It is fucking cool. But now, I do think the, I think the Bengals are going to, I think the Bengals are winning fairly easy. Oh, it seems like the Bengals do a great job on defense. 
That's what I'm saying. I feel like they'll get after. I yeah. feel like they'll get after Pat a little bit. Kansas City is like the Big 12, dude. Like they think... fucking air raid that thing out, but for whatever reason, like they'll go shot for shot in games with other teams because their defense like can't get it done. And, and I, I don't know that like... that probably hurt to hear from Kansas. Yeah, and I don't feel like they got an O line like that that's going to protect him because also the high ankle sprain isn't it his right ankle mobility. That's his back foot. Yeah, I think, I think it's... it's his right ankle. It is. All right. I think go. the Bengals see blood in the water. And it, it, it's going to be a long day for the Kansas City Chiefs. That's yeah. what I think. Wow, that's what that's what I think. What's so funny? So Jack? you're undecided on on uh, San Francisco and Eagles, which is fair. I am now. But right now, you're willing to stamp it. Well, you and the Chiefs have got a weird fucking deal I, going, bro. I, and I know that's that's what people might think, but also if you look at what's what just unfolded over the weekend, I think that's a fair thing to say. Right. But you can't count out Pat Mahomes, dude. That dude was literally jumping in the air just to throw a little little toss over to Travis Kelsey. He was doing some things even then. Now I'm counting him out. Chad, is it Chad Henney? Michigan legend. Takes him on a 98-yard fucking drive. Does an incredible job. Dices the boys up like it's no big deal at all. Was literally out, out there being a field general, crushing it for the boys. You put him in the game, he's a stud too now. They have fucking they have an elite offense. I don't know what their defense is statistically, but it really seems to me like they're obviously the lacking piece that needs to figure it out, which is crazy. The Chiefs? Yeah, because they have Frank Clark, they have Chris Jones, like they have a they have an elite front that is scary to play against. But Joe Burrow's about to get nasty on them boys. He's about to get nasty. Joe is Joe cool, dude. The fucking we were talking about this when we were working out this morning. That slow-mo video in the snow where Joe fucking rips that thing and hits a spinny, hits a 360 piece. And then the, the receiver's not even in the fucking screen at that point. So he's like, yo, where is he, where's he shipping off this rocket to? He ships that rocket off to the left side. He just does a cool little spin, arms flop it in the air like Gumby. And all of a sudden, that little thing just places it perfectly to that wide receiver. It's incredible. Look at this. And he's just so fucking Buddy, cool. Buddy, that, like, that is just fucking cool. That is cool. Before Joe Burrow got to the Bengals, I don't care who you are. I don't even care if you're a Bengals fan. You look at those helmets and that uniform and that team, you'd be like, man, they fucking suck. Joe Burrow makes that shit cool as hell. I don't That's know. Not a shot. I don't know. Chad Ochocinco back when he was playing, they, Bro, they, they he, had a couple 12 and 4 seasons. They was nice. Eddie Dalton, dude, the Red Rocket. Mm -hmm. or the, what was Carson it? Carson Palmer. Yeah, Carson Palmer. I mean, but still, like, they were never like a team you'd be like, oh, we got to watch out for them. Joe Burrow is legit making them Super Bowl contenders year, like, he said I as guess long, it's year in and year out now, right? He Two years as, in a row. He said as long as he's there, they will always have a shot at winning right. the Super Bowl. They were talking about the AFC Championship game being in Atlanta. He said, go ahead and get those refunds, boss. Yeah. I think they win by double digits. Oh, it's getting stronger. I don't know about double digits, homie. I don't know about double digits, but I do. I think right now, if you're just looking at the game, this is a Monday. This comes out on Tuesday. You got to look at it and say you have no idea how Pat's feeling. He can shoot up all the things in the world, all the turtle in the world. He can literally numb the ankle. It's still going to fucking hurt, dude. Who are you picking? I'm picking the Bengals. Not not by double digits, but I'm picking the Bengals in that game. What do you think, Jack? You're back there, like, yeah. laughing. No, I was laughing just because you have a vendetta against... He really does, bro. It's I, tough and, to and, which, is tough, which is tough, too, because, you know, obviously Nebraska fans are tuned in to listen to the Matt Rule pod, and Nebraska loves their Chiefs, too, because that's, like, the closest pro team. No, I think I think the Bengals are going to win. I think they're going back to the Super Bowl. It's it, The Eagles 49ers game is the toss-up to me, but I... Yeah. I want to see the 49ers in it, especially for our benefit once we're out in AZ for the Super Bowl because, like, we have a lot more connections with the 49ers. But I don't see the Eagles letting up after this past game. It's tough to say that the 49ers are going to be able to handle them, but that's the game I'm looking forward to, I think, most. Yeah, that one's yeah, gonna be fucking That awesome. game is going to be elite, dude. It really is. Both games. I'm, I'm legitimately excited to watch football this weekend. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's going to be incredible. One thing to mention on the Buffalo Bills side, man, is... What a fucking story that would have been if they were able to pull it out against the Bengals and go win the Super Bowl. The DeMar Hamlin, DeMar was all there. the adversity. He was there. There was a hilarious picture, by the way. That have you guys seen, though, the conspiracy theories going around that that wasn't even DeMar Hamlin at the game because they, they don't show his face one time on the broadcast. He's wearing a hood, too. So there's something there. I'm not saying that's my conspiracy. No, like, you are the one saying it right now. No, the internet is. Go look it up. There's a lot of people out there bugging about that DeMar Hamlin was not actually at that game and they had someone just dressed up as him as a way to get the fans ready because you they had him on the broadcast the whole time and he's completely put it up covered face to toe like you don't see hands you don't see anything um just something to think about i think i want to buy that stock too do you really i think so what do you think tomorrow is then i don't know 
That's where it gets the, the rabbit hole goes deep. I know, and, and we all know. Like before the game, they were talking about announcing him walking out of the tunnel, and the person we were seeing, Demar, not he seemed like he had some, you know. Well, he was like person, there, like moving well. Like when he got off the golf cart, it was almost like he had a little jog into the locker room. Some some uh, person stitched it on TikTok, and they were talking about their mom is a cardiovascular surgeon, and they're saying with what he went through that you shouldn't be able to put your hands above your head this far out of what was happening to him. And they show a close-up of him in the box, and he's doing this, and he's, like, cheering. Wow. I don't know. I, don't, I, I have no stance on yeah. this. I just like to... Present it. Yes. Yes, and, that is, and that's a great job going through those rocky waters, right? Because we don't be disrespectful to DeMar and his oh. situation. He might be an absolute alien and have an amazing... Like, doing what he's doing is... According to the cardiovascular mother, who knows? It's a big deal. I was told by people that are in the world of knowing cardiovascular stuff that when this first went down, this is literally the next day. I'm having a conversation with people that like they were saying he's got a little to any chance of even not being in a wheelchair for the rest of his life or not being uh, you know supported in some type of way. Now I am incredibly happy that he is he is now being all right. Like what a scary scene. We could have all. Kind of like we literally moved the pod because of it. Like we are trying to be as sensitive as possible situation. We're just talking about what we were told and what's out there all having the conversation. It's all speculation. One thing to not speculate though is the Nebraska Cornhuskers got themselves a fucking head coach, boys. They, they got themselves a fucking stud. This man, Matt Rule, came and sat on this on this little bitty couch and was out there putting out fucking... He was like a modern-day philosopher the way he was talking to us. He was talking about how his foundation goes to the team, what he does, the precedent he's going to set, what he does and does not want in the building, the types of guys that are going to take Nebraska back to those that 90s prevalence, I believe the word is. He was... Uh, I got fired up, at, even as a Michigan fan. You're like, damn, this is going to be great for the Bay 10. A guy like him... His attitude, his mindset, I can only imagine how you feel, Willie. You, everybody knows where I'm at. I think Nebraska will be back sooner than we all like to speculate on. How when soon? I say we all, I mean the haters. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. I think we're, I, you know, I think we're, we're, going to, we're going bowling this year. Well, you're going bowling no matter what. We're going bowling no matter what, but I think we're going to have a winning record. I think we hit at least seven wins this year. Beat Michigan? I'm sure. I'm sure I'll, I'll find a way to figure that out by the time that game comes. At win or lose, though, we can all agree that Matt Rule is a guy that you want leading your team. Right. He is all time. Yeah, all he, was time. A, he was a real deal. And I love his transparency. I love the way he was talking about the adversities he's went through, even in the instance where we were like, okay, you get fired, but obviously people, you know, being a fired head coach these days, you get the, what is it called? The money that they get? What's that called? The buyout, the buyout money that they get, it's like, okay, what kind of adversity were you really in? And then he goes in to talk about it. Uh, I think people will enjoy hearing that. They're going to enjoy it a lot. And there is a, uh, a very important document that is discussed on this, uh, on this bus that you will have to turn in, uh, tune into. And I hope you guys really enjoy it. Should we get to the episode? Yeah. Uh, before we do, uh, bus in one and a half weeks. So I guess it would be like a week left of the Budweiser merch. Yes, the Budweiser bow tie merch. If you zoom in on Jack's beanie, all of our merch with that logo will not be sold anymore will on our exist. site by the end of this month. So the pocket tees are bestseller. Um, our hoodies, oh, I'm not wearing one. Any of that stuff, the beanies, all that, it's yeah. going to be gone by the end of the month. Get that stuff. Thank you guys for making that number one throughout basically our entire existence. Entire but existence. Unfortunately, we got a little C and D and we will no longer be able to sell it. Yeah. With that being said, let's get to the episode right after. Wait, did we do shout out no free shout out on uh, this pod? My shout out no free shout out goes to the vibe, the day one takeoff going to Vegas with the boys. The hype, the energy, the vibes, they cannot be killed. That's my shout out no free shout out. My shout out no free shout out is going to when you're in college and you have a hard fought grind Monday through Friday and you have that early Friday workout and you get done, mm. you take that deep exhale and you know, hey, we worked hard. Now it's time to play hard with the boys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's I got the world in front deal. of you. All right, let's get to this episode. But before that, let's talk about sport clip. <coughs> Consider this. Not every hairstyle is created equal. Many stylists don't have much experience cutting men's hair, but... 
you do not know until it's too late. At Sport Clips, all stylists undergo specialized training specifically in how to cut and style men's hair, making them not just stylists, but scissor cutting scholars and fade fanatics. After all, it's not just an average it's not just any average haircut. This is a this is the big leagues we're talking about. And these are haircutting professionals. So don't hand your bushy old noggin over to just anyone with a pair of clippers. Sport Clips takes cutting men's hair to another level, which is why they truly are the pros in men's hair. And with that, we will now get to the Matt Rule episode. Special guest with us today, uh, Coach Matt Rule. Let's give this man a round of applause for being out here today. Went to Nebraska. Big Ten Championship coach Matt Rule. We uh, from you coming on this bus, traveling all the way to Nashville to come see us. I wanted to the give you a gift. Will and I talked about it, and we thought you should have this. Oh, it's a uh, is that? University of Michigan Compton jersey. Wow! And I thought you, you might want to hang that up in your I love it in your burn, wall or something burn that like thing that. Down, dude. Thank you so, very much. Yeah, Will really when we went to Michigan, oh, Will yeah. really wanted that. He thought I want to be a part of something special, so we got that for him. We were up there in Ann Arbor. Well, Michigan, they saw how well it went at Nebraska, and they're they like, did. oh, we got to we gotta do some jerseys for the boys, too. Because <laughs> Nebraska, you know how they take care of you at Nebraska. No, no doubt. They really do. I was wildly surprised when we were up there last spring, how they were literally for the boys the whole way. So much so that the next week when we were going to Michigan, and I was like sending texts to people like, hey, I need you guys to be straight. Like, I need you guys <laughs> yeah. to handle my boy. And they, they hooked the boys up and everything. Yeah. Both uh, outstanding schools. So... Let's get right into it, dude. How do you defeat Michigan? Oof. They are, uh, they're rolling. And they're rolling kind right of. now. They roll until they get to the playoffs. Well, I mean, it's a great game. You know, that game, I was actually in Mexico, and my wife, uh, she uh, she set up whale watching. And like... During the game? Dur- during the game. Oh, that's I have tough. a great picture of my son on the phone. Like, there's a, literally a whale jumping out of the water, and my son's over there watching the game. Oh, no way. It looked like it was going to be a blowout, but credit to Coach Harbaugh. They, they, the boys fought back. I mean, you know. I, I was know. For the Big Ten. You know, I was yeah. for the Big Ten. There you go. That's what we need to do. Because as, as the Big Ten, we had guys in the back who are SEC fans, Garrett and Jack, our SEC fans, and they're like, no, it's every man for himself out there. That's the Wild West. In the Big Ten, we have to come together. There's no doubt. Yeah. Because I think I personally think, like, the future of the Big Ten, we get SC, we get UCLA in. I think it's going to be, like, the premier conference. And so, um, but yeah, that boys. When, when, when the playoff expands, I'm excited to see what happens. I think our league will, you know, especially when they start playing some home games, uh, yeah. you know, if that, if that ends up being the deal. It's, imagine that game being played in Ann Arbor, what, what the difference would have been. You oh, know? yeah, dude, not, that hit not, not wouldn't stand a chance. So the, 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 I, as I walk across Nebraska's campus sometimes and feel that wind whip through you, I want to play games at home in December and, you feel and January. That fucking win with, when you get to the side of the Hawks, <laughs> no you're going to get some food. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. That wind just eats you up, bro. It's in, yeah, yeah. Let's play football in that. Let's yeah. play football in those conditions. Right. If you want to win the championship, you, you have to go on the road and play against somebody. So as they put together the college football playoff, I really hope that the home component is a big part of it. How, what's been your first impression in Nebraska? I've been blown away. I've been blown. You know, in this, in this world, like I took the job at Baylor, like, I show up, there's a camera in my face, and it's like, this is Baylor. Oh, okay, pretty cool. Like, um, get to Carolina. Oh, this is Carolina. Like, I actually I actually got to go out and check out Lincoln, and I really thought, like, I thought it was going to be, like, this small little town, like Stillwater, Oklahoma, or something. I got there, and the downtown, the Haymarket, the, the, the campus community, like, I've been blown away. I had no idea, though. I mean, I'm in Mexico. I'm at wherever I am. Someone comes up, go big red. Like just the Dude, reach. They are really yeah, like the that. reach. The yeah, reach is I really like that. No doubt. I went to uh we were in Arizona and I literally had to go to like a bank to sign like a document for a loan. And I just brought Will with me because we we're going somewhere right after. And the guy was like at first excited to meet me and then saw Will and moved him out of the way just to say go big red. And it was the Will Compton show for the next 25 minutes. I love it. Got me a couple of percentages down on that interest rate. Yeah, I appreciate yeah, I got you, you for that. brother. That's my fucking boy there's right there. Everywhere, bro. The Nebraska fan base is like second to none. Chapter it sounds like a obviously, gang. I'll, obviously, I'm biased, yeah. but I do think Nebraska's fan base is second to none out there. No, I, uh, that that much I've seen. And, um, but I just, I like the place, you know, I mean, and I, you know, you know, take over a new team, you never know what they're going to be like. Not, this is a really good group of guys too. Like they, they want to win. And I look back at this season, you know, they, it could have gone any which way. You guys have been on teams where, you know, things don't go the way you want them. Mm-hmm. They battled, you know, and to beat Iowa at the end of the year, they showed some grit and some toughness. And there's a lot of guys there that really, really love Nebraska. So I'm anxious to get started for them and do the best I can for them. What do you feel like did it for you? Like if you take out the, the fluff of saying like all the right things, like you got um, leaving Carolina. Getting fired in Carolina. 
getting fired Milo. at Carolina. Yeah, keep it yeah, real. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, yeah. Because it's good. Cause I'm I, sitting there, I'm like, should I say, got fired oh, from got Carolina? Fired, that was, hey, that's, you've opened up a whole lot of doors for us no, in this interview. No, I mean, I got fired. Like, it is what it is. Like, yeah. especially in that league, man, it's been so, I'll say this, it's been so good for me when I'm talking, I'm talking to recruits. And I'm even talking to the guys in this team. They're like, coach, I've been through this. Or, you know, I just transferred because of this. I'm like, bro, I was, just, I, same thing. Same thing just happened to me that's happening to you. Like, you know, so often as a coach, like the coach and then the player, like, like to me, I feel like I'm on the same level with them because I just went through, I went through elite adversity. Not many head coaches go through adversity because once you get fired, you're usually out of it. I was just able to get fired and then two months later, find a job that fit me. Um, so like, I feel like I'm on a whole, I'm, I'm so much better for having been through it. Not, not having the chance to coach in the NFL, that was really cool, but to get fired and to be made fun of and to be a meme and all that stuff, like that, that either breaks you or turns you into something like supernatural. Like not saying I'm supernatural, but I'm, I'm, but I'm working hard to get there. Supernatural you know what I'm like, right now. It fires me up. So it's just, it's been really good for me um, to go through that. When you say elite adversity and people would sit back and in the comments or anything else, talk about relate to, okay, I'm sure it's real tough going through that adversity with a buyout that you have. A lot of coaches, when they get fired, they get bought out. Scott Frost, literally everybody. Mm -hmm. When Bo got fired, but big buyout. There's big buyouts for coaches when they get fired. Explain the adversity you're talking about a little bit more because a lot of a lot of people do. It's like you do get fired, but there is a nice bag still yeah. sitting there for you no when doubt. that does happen. No doubt. I just mean more like... Yeah, it, you know, it's 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 the money's the money, right? And the money's ridiculous. Shouldn't it shouldn't be this much money to coach, but it the market's the market, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say no, right? Right. Um, I just think it's you know it, it's your kids, it's your family. Like, uh, you know, people have a tendency. You know, I think we all kind of look at athletes as like even me as a coach. Like, you look at athletes as you know just this entity. They're, you guys are people. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, you're people. Um, you, you, you look at coaches and you see them as like this person. We're just going to criticize, but we're people, right? And so, like for me, like walking out of a stadium and putting my arm around my son, and you know, he just had fifty thousand people chanting for his dad to get fired. Like that ain't fun. Mm -hmm. They had every right to do it. I got no issue with it. You try to teach lessons, but like you go through all that. Your, your daughters come home and she's like, "We have to move again." Like that's real. And I'll never forget um, Brad Childress. You guys know Coach Childress was at Vikings. He, he called mm -hmm. me. He texted me. He didn't even, I don't even know him. Yeah, he said, Matt, you'll be so much better of a coach for having gone through this because you know part of my job I have to fire coaches. I have to I've had to fire players. Yeah, I've had to cut players. And um, when you go through it and you see what it feels like, the empathy, the how public it is, I just think it's that part of the, probably the public part of it. Where like you walk into the grocery store afterwards and people look like you, like you're a dead man walking. And it's like they didn't kill me. You know, yeah. I, yeah. I'm still here. I'm still alive. <laughs> so that part maybe just as a dad is hard. But no, to your point, you make great money. It's all part of it. Like, this is the life I've chosen. It's like the mafia. Like, I chose to be a coach, the highs and lows of it. But you go through some – the adversity is pretty tough for, for your kids when, you know, you're sitting there like, oh, I hope they're not reading this. I hope they're not reading that. You, usually they are. So. How old are your kids? I have an 18-year-old son. Yeah. Oh, he's nine definitely is, seen Oh, yeah, he's seen definitely seen everything. Yeah. <laughs> he's one day he came in, he's like, he's like dad, dad, Stephen A. Smith is going in on you. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, right, no. Well, it is what it is, buddy. But but I have nine and seven-year-old daughters, and they're the ones I, you know, my son kind of knows it. My, my daughters, I kind of, when my son was, I don't know, maybe nine or 10, I was coaching at Temple. I was an assistant coach at the time, and Andy Reid um, was kind of coming to the end in Philly. We went to a game. And the Patriots got up on the Eagles and the whole crowd started chanting, fire, Andy. And so my son's sitting there, he's eight or nine. He's going, fire. I'm like, no, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. So when they started chanting to fire me, I'm like, pretty good company, buddy. Andy Reid's the, he's the goat. So, yeah. Uh, but I got a cool family, eight, 18, nine and seven. Yeah. That's um, awesome, dude. As a very new parent, Taylor, obviously he's a, he's a dad of two, five and five and two, five and two. Yeah. Um, Hearing you talk about your son being 18 and seeing absolutely everything, um, I'm more so asking, like, what is that mindset for you when you know he's reading and seeing all this stuff and he's either approaching you like, oh, I wonder how my dad's going to respond. How important it, for you is it to, like, respond in the correct way to show a lesson in those moments? Because I feel like even though he's seen it, he's probably feeling like, fuck, man, I wish he wasn't, blah, blah, blah. But then he goes in and sees the way you respond and it kind of rubs off on him like, man, he's kind of... He's responding this way. I, I probably wouldn't respond that way. Yeah. Well, I mean, at, at some point in his life, and I think as parents, the mistake we sometimes make is we try to protect our kids from everything. No, we can't protect them because it's coming no matter what. Like if you protect them till they're 18, the adversity or the, the crack that they have in their lives comes when they're 30, when they're 40. So it's about just teaching them how to respond to it. And I think for me, like if I've done one thing well, I hope that after every game I've ever coached, win or lose, when I've been, I've been coach of the year and I've been fired. Yeah. Like, 
be the same guy. You know, like come home after the game and don't take it out on your kids. Don't take it out on your wife. Don't, don't want to talk to me. Like, like if I say that my true purpose, like I love football. It's my passion. My purpose in life, I think is to be a great man, a great husband, great father. So if I say that, I got to live up to that. And I have to live up to it in the hardest of moments. Like the day after I got fired, like, did I, you know, did I take my kids to school or did I sit home and feel sorry for myself? Like, let them see what it means to truly be a man, to truly be the person you say you are in the hardest of times. And so that's, that's what I try to do. And I tried to lean into it. And I try to have the conversations with my son because, you know, when I was at Temple, I remember we beat Penn State, we ranked, walking down the street, he was younger and, and someone was like, Coach Rule, I love you. And I'd always say to him, is that real? He'd say, wow, did you love that? I said, no, it's not real. Is that real? It's not real. What's real to me is that my players say, you know, coach did the best he could for me. My coaches say that. And my family says that. And if I teach that to my kids, you know, I don't want my kids growing up thinking the world, you know, how the world sees them is who they really are. Who they really are is what they do when no one's watching. You know, like I got my Twitter game. I'm trying to perfect my Twitter game. It's not very good, but I'm trying right now. That's, but that's not who I am. That's just something fun that I do. Like, who am I in my darkest of moments, my toughest of moments? And then who, who are the people in your lives that show up in those moments? Um, there was, player, there was play, you know, think about this in the NFL. There were, there were players on the Panthers who, who drove to my house just to check in on me and my family. That's awesome. Like, like that's like, it's so like it didn't work out for me, but I know I had some sort of an impact, at least on somebody. Mm. I wasn't perfect. But if they see that, if my kids see that, then hopefully they live a life and your kids live a life where it's like, you know what? We're going to have adversity. How do we handle it? Yeah. When you're, when you're a head coach of a team now on the other side, you have to actually go and fire these guys and your son being 18 years old, has your son ever stepped in and been like, hey, I love this person or I love, or why would you do about that? Like a player, like, like a player. A player. Like, yeah, if you, had, if you had to cut a player and like your son was like a big fan of I'm sure he would come mm -hmm. to the practices yeah. and meet these guys. And as all kids are, they kind of get drawn to one or two players. And sometimes you have to say goodbye to those one or two players. Like, how do you handle that with your son? R really hard. And I, I, honestly, if you have a, if there was a drawback for me as a pro coach is that I really struggled with that. Like yeah. after being a college coach for a long time, like, I was used to like, you know, when you're a coach, you can, you're kind of, you're kind of taking this path, but you see where the end could be. You, you see the potential in somebody like, Hey, in, in three or four years. So I'm going to pour into that person knowing I get in the NFL, man. It was like, you, it's Saturday after a walkthrough and they walk, the GM walks down like, Hey, we got to make a roster move. Uh, we, who do you want to get rid of? And it's like, Oh my gosh. Well, they, they phrase it to you like that. They usually don't. Is it, sorry, I hate to cut you off, but if a GM walks down and he's like, we had to cut a guy, who do you want to? Who do you want to cut? Yeah, sometimes it's like, hey, we need to make a move here. Is it this guy or this guy? How do you see it? Or we, we got to, yeah. you know, sometimes they're like, hey, let's get, you know, every, every place is probably different. But, you know, I work for some great GMs and they always wanted to like, hey, Matt, how do I work? You know, let's work together. But I I just had a hard time with that relationship part of it because it's like there's always this wall up between you and the player because when you walk down the hallway, they're like, hey, that's the guy that's eventually going to cut me. And it's going to come to an end at some point. And, yeah. you know, I had the unique perspective of a, a couple guys I had coached in college were playing for me in the NFL. So, I had this one relationship with them as their college coach as being like when they look at Ionitis. Ionitis taught me more. I'm, 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 pre I'm preparing to be a really good college coach because Matt taught me a lot after having played for me in college and then gone through being in the NFL for seven years. And he trusted me like him and I would sit there and just kind of talk. And, and he would talk to me about He's what it felt like perspective. He's right. awesome. And he, he said things to me that changed my coaching style. Like, I didn't, I didn't take into account because I can just not look at my Twitter. I don't take into account what it's like for a 24 year old guy. Like, one of the things I think is wrong with the NFL is every play is graded. <laughs> like every play is graded by someone else. Yeah. And so like, you know, PFF. oh my goodness. And so I'm not talking about anyone. I don't want to get myself crushed on this, whatever. But but like guys are coming off the game and it's like, you know, the world is telling them whether they played what, what good or they played bad. And no one really knows. Like yeah. if you and I could grade the film, we're two coaches, we might disagree. So the amount of pressure, like the amount of stress and anxiety on these guys is overwhelming. And you know, the locker room and the coaching staff, it has to be a safe play. You have to come in and, you know, we can coach you, but you know, Matt, Matt, would, Matt, Matt did a great job of teaching me like, Hey Matt, coach, Matt, these guys are, these guys are under a lot of pressure. They're under a lot of pressure, social media wise, a lot of pressure, like with their families, like let's, let's, let's build a space where we can coach them hard, but we can also, um, we can also coach them the right way, you know? And so I think as I come back to college, I'm seeing the same thing, man. Like everything these guys do, it's, it's especially, you know, in, in major college football, it's, it's seen. And so, wanting to make sure it's a place where we push them, but also kind of a safe space as well, where you can make a mistake and know that you're still cared about. Yeah. yeah. Besides the cutting part, it seems like college is much more ruthless. The fan bases go way harder. Like, I, I don't know how it is at, at Nebraska, Nebraska, but Michigan everything is can, will skin you alive if you they think you had a bad game or something like that. And that is, that is tough when you're a college player. And I feel like the coaching staffs too. 
or like in the winter time, like that you start doing those 6 a.m. morning workouts, guys are killing you. And I feel like just the process of college is much harder than the process of the NFL. The games are obviously more difficult in the NFL, mm-hmm. but it is a long time to be around those kids. He's around them all the time. I don't know how it changes now because the NIL deals. I had guys from Michigan say, hey, I'm off the whole month of March. I'm thinking to myself, we never had a month off. Did you ever have a month off? I think it, it was like May. Not like a month. We'd have three weeks off. Oh, shit. I There's never had like that. A, what they call like fifth semester. In between like the end of the spring and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and I like never had the, anything like at that. The end yeah. of spring ball until you start summer workouts. There's always like a three-week thing because yeah. some, some guys can go back to class and they got to take like three or four hours of one class per day just to get that credit. Mm-hmm. Some guys wouldn't have to do it. Oh, so they damn. send you home with a workout program for like three weeks. <laughs> you missed yeah. out on your I week. missed out big time. I, I was in school always. They duped you, bro. They duped me well, bad. They, you were in school always, you know. <laughs> yeah, them grades weren't the best. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was the king of 2.0. <laughs> I made a very, uh, a plan A choice, and that is it when I got to college. But it is, I feel like uh, you're dealing with with different maturity levels as well. Like these kids are 18 years old. You're basically... Like you have to do a good job, good job of implementing the offense, defense, and special teams, but you're also your job is on the line with eighteen and twenty two year olds. Like, does that add a level of stress to you, or does it is it more of like, hey, we get the mold in a certain way as well? Yeah, I, I think um, I think uh, for me, like being in the NFL and seeing guys every week that I had coached playing on other teams, I think um, having a chance to coach some of them, and then after you get fired, like those guys reaching out to you, like you know, I've always said, you know. Uh, my sort of my core philosophy is I want every player that plays for us to look back and say like, you know what, playing for them made my life a little bit better. Whether it's, you know, what I've got to play in the NFL, I got a great degree. They taught me something. And so sometimes when you go through that, like sometimes you don't know how people feel about you till you're dead. Mm-hmm. But when you get fired publicly, like I did, a lot of guys reached out to me and it, it meant a lot to me. And I was like, you know, I crave that. I want to get back to that. I think the good thing for me coming to Nebraska is it's my fourth head coaching job in 11 years. Like the mistakes I made early on, I'm almost embarrassed about things I did at Temple. Like, but I've learned, I've, mm-hmm. I've mastered kind of that craft of working with those guys over time, I hope. Um, and so like, I, I want to go there. I, I want to push them. I want to coach them. I'm old school. Like we're going to, we're going to practice hard and I'm going to coach them hard, but that doesn't ever have to, that doesn't, I can demand them. I don't have to demean any, anyone. I don't have to, if I look back, even in my time in Carolina, I feel like there's only one time that I truly regret, but I, really, I don't think I've ever ever threw anybody under the bus. Like, I don't yeah. think I ever said like, well, we just don't have this or we don't have that or it's this guy's fault. I tried to always made for some awkward moments because sometimes I was probably trying to overprotect the guys, but I always feel like that's my job is that like, you want to be a leader, get out front, man, like take the bullets for your guys and we'll hope that your guys respond for you. And so, um, I think if I do that, uh, I'll have a chance to affect some of those guys' lives. And as I built my staff, I, I built a staff that I, I trust. Like I have 14 former players, working for me in some way. I got three guys from the, that played for me at the Panthers, even like working in different areas. I got guys from Carol, uh, from Carolina. I got guys from temple from Baylor. I, I'm not hiring them because they're my friends. I'm hiring them because I trust them. Like they're going to work hard for the players. And I think that's what the guys need. They need people they can look up to and they can help them through the trials and tribulations of being mm-hmm. 18, 19, 20, mm-hmm. 21. That one time you regret in Carolina, are you free to talk about that? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you know, Cam Newton's one of my favorite, favorite players I've ever been around. Like, mm-hmm. Like the the brutal honesty that he would share with me, um, the conversations every Tuesday, him and I would meet for an hour. We played Buffalo and <laughs> we called a play and it was the fourth fourth and one. We went for it and and Cam threw the bubble out there, it was incomplete. And after the game, they asked me like what happened. And I wasn't even thinking about it with Cam. You know what I'm saying? I was thinking about it more like I was frustrated with us as coaches that we had that, you know, and so we're thinking that's gonna be a quarterback run, get a yard. You know, they rotated the safeties, which changed the mic point. So Cam knew he was in trouble. So Cam's such a high-level thinker. He knew it. So he threw the bubble out. So when they asked me afterwards, I said, we didn't call that to throw the bubble. Like, I didn't want to throw a bubble there. Right. The next day, I'm like, oh, my gosh. You know, sometimes they beat up coaches. You know, they beat up Zach Wilson after the Jets game. They beat up coaches. With, I wish people knew what it felt like to go have your adrenaline at, like, 200, have your heart rate at, like, 190. And, you know, you go walking in and some media person's like, here's this. They're going to ask you this. They're going to ask you this. They're going to ask you this. And you have about eight seconds to get ready for the post-game press conference. And then that's one time for me, it just got away from me. And I didn't mean, I apologized to Cam. And he was great. I mean, he's the ultimate professional coach. I got it. But I just hated it, you know, because it came across like I was saying that about him. And there, there's no guy, like that guy was there at 11 o'clock at night. And that guy was there at five o'clock in the morning. Like Cam Newton was a grinder. And so mm-hmm. I, that's the last thing I wanted to do was put him on the spot. And it just came out that way. And you know, it's hard to put the toothpaste back in the, yeah. like in the bottle after that. But, you know, it's just sometimes I, I, I let my frustration get me one time because I was mad because I thought we had a chance. 
And, uh, you know, we just made a bad play call probably. Damn, dude. Why don't you think it worked out in Carolina? For me? Yeah. Um, you know, I think, I think I took over kind of a tough situation. Like, you know, there's a lot of Hall of Famers on that team that were, that were leaving. And, you know, right off the bat, you know, you know they ended up letting Cam go. And then Luke retired. And so I, I think if I look back, I would have just tried to do it faster. You know, I would have tried to, I would have tried to be a little more aggressive in free agency. I tried a big trade. Um, but that wasn't really the plan. I'm, I'm kind of a loyal guy. Like, if you tell me, like, this is how I want to do it, then I'm going to do it that way, and I'm going to take responsibility for it. Even if maybe it's not always what I agree with. Like, mm -hmm. if, if we say, hey, we're doing it this way, we'll do it. So I just, you know, I never got the offense going. Like, we we went from, like, the worst defense in the league the first year. We were second the second year. I thought the defense was coming on. And even this year, um, like, I was proud the way they played down the stretch. Like, they played well enough, and Steve did a great job. They, they, but I knew that team. Like, if you go back to my press conferences early, I said, guys – we just signed Baker. Like, just give him a chance. That's, we have to play. Like, you know, a lot of teams start off one and three, one and four, and they kind of make a run. You saw that this year with some teams. Mm -hmm. So I just thought once they won a couple games, the pressure would come off. Once I thought we got past the 49ers, because that's a pretty good team. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it wasn't for me. And it was one of those things where I had picked up so much steam. Like, the fan base was pretty agitated about me at the end of last year. They were agitated about me. And once that happens, it's, it's really hard to, to stop it. So, um, but yeah, there's, there's all kinds of things. Like, what if we would have done this? What if we would have done that? But I kind of tried to do in the NFL what I did in college, which was like a slow build to have a really good team. Whoever gets that job, I think they have a pretty good roster. I mean, you got Brian Burns, DJ Moore, Derek Brown. The, the offensive line's pretty. He was drafted Icky last year. You know, mm -hmm. of course, like Corbett tore his ACL, but Taylor Moten's under a long-term contract. I think like 20 of the 22 starters are under contract next year. So I think it's a job that people should take because they'll, they'll have, they have a pretty good roster there and a good culture in that locker room. When you uh, when you first get in there, and, uh, you said be more aggressive in free agency and bigger trade. Like, how much of influence did you have in those things with the GM? Like, uh, like I don't know how things work outside the Titans. I was only with the Titans, yeah. but it seemed like John Robinson, like he was running the show, yeah. and, th and that's and that's what it was. And I don't I don't know how it usually works with a, with a head coach and a GM. I think you know. So I had I, I was the head coach basically. I was their head coach for two years and five games. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I had two GMs in two years. So you know, obviously you have one, and then you're trying to work with another one. I had yeah. Marty Herney, who's awesome. And Scott Fitter is cla as classy a dude as there is. Um, there's not one like major trade we could have had that we didn't do. Like, oh, we should have yeah. pulled the trigger on it. More like looking back, it's like, hey, if you only have two years, man, let's, let's go, let's go shoot it our shot. Yeah, it yeah. You could have been under the influence that you had time. Yeah. Like, well, yeah. So like for me, if you say like, Hey, let's, I just want this kind of built over three or four years, I'm gonna build over three or four years. If it's two years, it's two years. And so I would have probably just probably maybe made a trade, maybe traded up for a quarterback or mm. something like that. Um, you, know, you go back over, the, we tried a lot of things at quarterback, you know, we traded for Sam. I was happy to see the way Sam played down the stretch. You know, we traded for Baker. We, uh, we brought Cam back, you know, so we tried a bunch of different things. Um, so, you know, it just, it just wasn't, maybe wasn't meant to be, wasn't the right time, um, maybe the right place, but I, I, I like the players there. I mean, I really mm. do. Like I, 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 I turn on the 49ers. I love watching Christian run wild. Like, I love yeah. watching the Panthers play. Like, I could watch Frankie Louvu play all day long, man. He's one of the best playing football players I've ever been around. So, I had good memories from it, but just just didn't quite work out the way I thought it would. What was it like seeing Christian McCaffrey go to the Niners? So, so you know, it's funny. He um he got traded. I texted him right away, like, because I got fired. And then all of a sudden, a week later, he gets traded. And, um, house. yeah, and he was like, Hey, he said, he said, he said, Hey, Let's coach, Christian McCaffrey out of here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he called me. He, he was like, I'll call you right back. I said, don't call me. You got enough going on. So just, if you ever need me, call me. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I, you know, he's just such a great dude, man. So the next day, my wife and son are at the airport. They're getting ready to fly up to Penn state. That's my alma mater. And there's a white out and the, the AD there is a good friend of mine. So we just wanted my son, you know, he wanted to go to college visit, just get him away. So they're at the airport. I'm going to babysit the nine and seven year old. I'm, 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 I'm a daddy uh, for the weekend. And they're, they're like the FBO, and Christian comes walking in, and my son sees him. Christian just got traded. He's getting ready to go to fly to uh, San Francisco. He turns, makes a left, walks over, hugs my wife. And, and I was just, my wife is one of those wives, like, even in the NFL, just think, even in the NFL, she would have a different position group over every Thursday night during the season. Never mandatory, not like, hey, we need you. Like, DJ Moore and Robbie Anderson, it was like 12, 15 at night. She's like, guys, you have to leave. It's time to go. Like, right. those guys would come over. We would kick it, hang out. It was just, so she felt part of the team. And so I get fired. She doesn't get to see anyone. Like, there's no closure for her, even. Yeah, she's with some friends. Yeah, so so Christian walks up, hugs her, hugs Bryant, and uh, says some things. I'll keep, you know, just says some really positive things to them. They kind of needed that. And that's, that's, that's who he is, man. So, like, when I see what he's doing right now, I'm fired up. I'm fired up for him because he deserves this opportunity. You know, he, he got run a lot. His last year at Stanford, his first couple of years in the NFL, like his percentage of carries 
I mean, was elite. So unfortunately, during my time, you know, he he had some injuries. I feel like though his body rested, and you know, he didn't make all he didn't make the Pro Bowl this year. I told him I said, well, just settle for being the Super Bowl MVP. How about that? Yeah, like, I think he could. Like, yeah, you know. and my first overall draft pick in the fantasy. Nice. Yeah, I was, well was a smart move by me. Dude, when we played the Panthers, it was always like that's you stop him, you win the game. Like he was like a ridiculous percentage of touches, like running and c- catching the ball. No doubt, the guy's elite. Yeah, truly elite. Yeah, he is. What um, being the head coach there and then seeing him get traded, is it kind of like what are what? Why would the Panthers trade him away? He's the best player. Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid to touch that yeah, one. Okay, my <laughs> ball, my but ball. I, I just, I just, I just, think, but I just think, I just think hey, they got all a question, yeah, Willie. Yeah, nice job, because yeah. he is. Cause, you, yeah, because once they they fired you and they got rid of him, everyone's like, yo, what are the Panthers doing? Right, right, right. But, and I, I think that's a, a lot of credit to the guys in the locker room because they they made a run. Like I told them when I, that when I got fired, I went in, you know, I went and talked to the team after I got fired, and um, which I does told, not happen. Yeah, but I, you know, and, and Mr. Tepper gave me that opportunity, which I appreciate. And I told them, and I, and I went in, and I talked about the game first. Like, I went in, like, like they didn't know I was fired yet. Mm. And I went in, and I said, Here, here's what I f- see from the game. Here's how I think it affects us. And then I said, hey, I'm not going to be your coach anymore. I said, but, you know, all I ask every guy every year is like, hey, in the offseason, handle your free agency. Handle your business. Handle your money. Do what's right for you. But once we sign up for the year, just, 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 just ride it out to the end of the year full bore. So I was here for you guys the whole year. I'm being asked to leave. Mm. But that doesn't mean I'm not in it with you. Like, I hope you guys win. And I expected you guys to win. Because when I started the year off, I, I looked at Tampa Bay and I looked at uh, Atlanta, the first couple games, and I and I, and I I looked at New Orleans. And I said, guys, we're going to have a chance to beat all these teams. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't know about the rest of, you right. know, FC West and all that, how they're But I thought we had a chance. And so they came down the stretch. Credit to Steve Wilkes. He's a really good coach. Kept them together. And the guys did a good job. And they had a chance at the end to, to go win it. So that's good experience for them because they might have a chance to make a run next year if they can keep that, you know, team together. Steve took over as the interim head coach at the yeah, time. He did, yeah, he did. and so they're still trying to find a head coach now. They are. Yep. Yeah, and he is he a candidate or no? I don't. They don't. They don't. Communicate I know they don't. Tell, I don't know if they were. <laughs> but I th- and I'm sure he usually is. they say like, hey, this inter- he's not going to be blah blah blah. We're going to start interviewing these guys and yeah. stuff like that. Did you speak on Coach Wilkes for a second, Absolutely. just because I know back when I was in Washington, I feel like he's been a name that's been in the circuit yeah. for years now on being a head coaching candidate. Well, he went out to Arizona. He was the head coach in Arizona and just kind of in that transition. Right. Kind of like the same thing I talked about. Sometimes you, get, you just kind of get caught up. You're you're a great head coach. It's just the right the wrong place at the wrong time. I think Steve, when I, right around him after about a month, I remember saying to him like, hey. You know, I don't know what will happen here, but if I can ever help you in this, because I just could tell his leadership and his command. And so, like, you know, they're going to go through the head coaching searches right now. and co- They just went through it in college. You're going to go through it in the NFL, and they're going to talk about all these really cool coordinators. And to me, that you know, being a head coach and being the coordinator is about, like, you know, you're both doctors, but, one, you know, one's a, one's a you know, cardiologist and, and one's an oncologist. Like, like it's completely different. Like, mm-hmm. the, the things you deal with as a head coach— especially in the NFL, you're dealing with the GM, you're dealing with the owner, you're dealing with you know, player issues, you're dealing, you're dealing with all these things, you're dealing with game management, you're dealing with situational football. Um, Steve, is, I think, is great at all those things. I think he's an elite head coach. He has experience. You know, a lot of times you get fired as a head coach and they don't bring you back. Well, you, got all, you have experience. You know, you've seen what worked, you've seen what doesn't work. And the coaches I look up to the most, the Andy Reid, the Bill Belichick's, those guys. By the way, those are the first guys that reach out to a guy like me when I get fired. Those are the first guys. That's awesome. Um, I mean, like, they're classy. As, but, like, they went somewhere. They were head coaches. They went through what I went through, and their better day, best days were ahead of them. So that's why when I came to Nebraska, I was like, can we do it here? I walked around. I looked around, saw the fan base, saw the support, saw all, everything. I said, I'm, I'm going to come here. I'm going to I'm, I'm, I'm gonna have to make sure my best days are ahead of me, not behind me. Yeah, buddy. Hey, you heard him. Can I do it here? Yeah, I believe he can. But if you look at your history as a, as a head coach, it's it's a slow burn. And then all of a sudden, like at Temple, were you guys three and nine your first year? No, my first year were two and ten. Two, two and ten. ten. Yeah. And, but then after after a while, like you said, you guys beat Penn State. Yeah. You guys were ranked, right, and stuff like that. So, how do you see it going in Nebraska the first year? Because two years ago, best three and nine team in the in the NCA. Absolutely, arguable. With that, yeah. well, I don't think it's even arguable anymore. People still like to argue it. Yeah, because people like to facts. punch up. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's just factual, yeah, it's you know. factual. And so, but then last year it just it didn't go as well as possible. There was a lot of turmoil. Obviously, yeah. Scott Frost getting uh, fired early in the year. You guys lose off American soil. It does not count. But that's yeah. may put you yeah, into a bit of a exactly. spin, right? Yeah. So now, like you're looking at your roster. One of your big time leaders was it Garrett Nelson? Yeah, that's his name. Mm-hmm. Goes to the NFL. Yeah. Who like when we spoke to him in spring, he was like lived breathed corn like he was He's the example of like the, yes yep. black shirt uh, yeah, yeah a black shirts and so 
Who do you, I mean, we're not going to talk about your roster because I don't even know the guys on there. And I would never ask you to speak about your guys. Right. But how do our you guys. see it going? Our, your guys, guys. Yeah, yeah. How do you see it going in this first year? Yeah. Because you got some winnable games the first three games. That fourth one's going to be tough. But that you can, you have an opportunity to possibly be 3-0 and going into the bus and bowl. <laughs> you know what? I'll, I'll say this. Um, I always look like, I always say to myself, when you go to a place, the first thing you have to do is establish like the foundations of how do we work. So I went to Temple. I had been I had been an assistant coach the year before. I mm -hmm. left and went one year to the Giants and came right back to be the head coach. But we were moving up in conference. They were going from the MAC to the kind of the Big East slash American as it was for me. So there was a there was like a we go up in conference. Something's you know yeah. it's gonna be hard. So we went. Like it's like high school four A now you're going up to five A. So like we were playing better competitions. The roster had to catch up. So we were two and ten. Um, I played. I just played all the freshmen. I said, I'm going to play these guys. And in four years, we're going to win a championship. And we did, right? We went and those two and seniors 10, must have hated six. you. Ben Winston. And I played the se no, I'm say this. I played the seniors that w wanted to do it my way. And some of them were awesome. Yeah. But I just inserted a lot of the young guys as well. When I went to Baylor, there was, I think, 45 scholarship players. We had three offensive linemen. I moved the two tight ends. I moved one to center. And I moved one to left tackle. And so I was coming, taking over after a scandal like, we were one eleven. Um, I mean, but but it was it was hard. But that that was more about what the out the Baylor was more of like a, a welcome mat in the Big Twelve. Yeah, well at and, that time. Well, yeah, and, and so it's just I was taking over a hard place at a hard time. I was just so I don't want this to be a slow burn. I want to yeah. start off because I feel like that year for them was last year. And the thing that I respect about the team because because this opportunity was around for a while and I was just watching games. And what I respected about Nebraska was the players. They had just lost their coach. They had some tough losses along the way, but they just kept battling. And, like, to me, that's half the battle. Like, if you can get a group of people to commit to playing hard and fighting, even when you're kind of out of bowl contention, like, if you go to Iowa the last game of the year and Iowa has to win that to go to the Big Ten West and you beat them, there's something in that locker room. So hey, I, that, that fired I me up. That was, yeah, that was a solid. It was a quote that. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I don't know. I don't know how good we are yet. I don't think. But, like, I just know this. I, don't, I know that we're starting from a place of, like what a big physical looking group. And I think we've done a good job recruiting so far. And, you know, the, they changed football on me during my time away. Now, like we're, we're already yeah. up to like 32 players that we can sign. Like when I got to Baylor, I can only sign 25, 20, you know, I could find a way to sneak somebody in there, kind of some u u unique rules, but I have more options available to me right now. So I'm excited. You know, I, I just want us to be the kind of a team. And sometimes it's hard when you have a fan base that's really passionate. I just want us to be the kind of team that's really humble. Like, Hey, we feel like we can win every game. We also know we have a chance to lose every game, so let's just let's just work about, worry about today. Like I got guys talking to me about the bowl games next year. I'm like, whoa, let's just go to the weight room, guys. Yeah, yeah. Go, to, go to go eat. Let me we'll go to come class. To handle that because yeah. I'll, I'll 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 be handling yeah, that. Yeah, no matter what, you guys are going to a bowl yeah. next year. Yeah. No matter what, you guys will be in a bowl. You're the bus and bowl. <laughs> the bus and bowl. We yeah. created a bowl so we could be bowl. Yeah. Yeah. So no matter what, you guys will be in a bowl. So you talk about Baylor. You're walking into a situation, bit of a scandal going on. It was a, an empty roster, to say the least. Did your mindset change when you walked into Nebraska and you're like, could we do this here? Because when you walk into Baylor, I'm sure there's a piece of you that's like, this is a lot to work with. Yeah, yeah. This is a lot. Like, how am I yeah. going to make this work? Yeah. Because I'm curious, too, why Nebraska? Like, again, you you come off a head coaching job in the NFL. I'm sure you got your – once you got fired, it was like your name was everywhere for a lot of big college jobs. And I'm just curious, like, yeah, why Nebraska? What was so enticing about it Yeah. So uh, to, go, to go there? I, I think for me, it's one thing to go somewhere and try to take a program to someplace they've never been. You know, mm -hmm. they're, 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 that, that this is getting some a program back to where it has been. Mm -hmm. And that's completely different because, you know, they have the resources, you know, they've been there before. They've seen that rare air. And so for me, it's like, OK, they've done it. So we know that. So what are my questions? Well, do they have the facilities? Absolutely. Uh, I, really, a big lesson that I've learned is to make sure that I am my plan is similar to the plan of the people that I'm around. You know what mm -hmm. happened in the NFL? Like, you know, sometimes you have differing views. And so. When I talked to the athletic director, Trev Alberts, who had played there, he believed in the same things I believed in. So it's not like I'm trying to convince him, no, this is the way to do it. Trust me. Like, he's like, no, Matt, I see exactly what you, how you feel. Um, Ted Carter, who, who's, who's the president of the university, like when I talked to him, he was the admiral at Navy when they were run, when they were rolling in the triple option and we went down there and beat them. So he knew what my teams looked like at Temple. He was like, Matt, just build that team here. Like that physical, like I want to run the ball. Yeah. And I want to play defense. And that's not – some fan bases don't really like that. Like, some fan bases, like, if you're not going no huddle spread, they don't want to come to the games. Nebraska people want us to run the football and play defense. They want us to dominate the line of scrimmage. They want us to be physical. And that's kind of who I've always been. So 
those things all came together. But the biggest question I had was, can we recruit here? Yeah. Like, can I get players here? And I actually looked at Michigan. I looked at Ohio State. I looked at Penn State. And whereas maybe, maybe, maybe 15 years ago, Penn State or Ohio State, you know, most of their kids came from that state. Everyone's kind of recruiting nationally now, right? Mm-hmm. So I went back and said, Look, let's watch the kids. There's some really good football players in Nebraska. And I thought, hey, you know what? We can get players. Because if we get good players there, we'll coach them, I think, and we'll play hard and we'll, we'll find a way to win. And um, I took a shot. And my wife knew it the whole time. She's like, this is the place for you. Really? Said, oh, yeah. I've been married for 20, 24 years, 20, going on 20. Like, I've learned to listen to her. She said, this is the place for you. This, this is where you fit. Because she knows the way I want to play football. I, I want to go out there and just make it a battle of physical wills. And I think that resonates with people in Nebraska. Yeah. Dude, we got knows, some baby. heat going yes. here, boys. <laughs> Nebraska. He's doing well. So if you're trying to set down a foundation, you want to, this is the way you want to play football. You go up in the locker room, right? In the O-line locker room of the Tennessee Titans, it's uh, speed off the ball, physical toughness. Like those are our foundational pieces. Mm-hmm. What are you, what is day one implementation of making sure your foundation is set at Nebraska? So I, um, I have about four things I believe in that I'll talk about. I had my first team meeting last night. Mm-hmm. And I'm one of those guys, I don't let cameras in. I'm like, there ain't going to be a camera following me around. I want it always to be the players. But there's there's a um, there's a book called The Greatest Salesman in the World by Og Mandino. In, in it, they have 10 scrolls. And there's one called The Scroll Mark Three. It's I will persist until I succeed. And it, at one point it says, it's this long, you know, if I read it to the team. I start off by reading it to the team. Yeah. And it basically says, you know, I am not a sheep. I refuse to walk, talk, act, think like a sheep. The slaughterhouse of failure is not my destiny. Um, and it's and so it's like I am a lion. Like so, like he's fucking keep going. So, so yeah, to keep me, going. Life, keep reading that out loud to yeah, me. Yeah. I want to keep but, hearing this. Like, I can't. I'll, I can't do it. I have it on my phone. But <laughs> but, but that, that's like my life first. Like and that goes back to what I said. What happened to me? Um, when I say happened, when I got fired. It was like all these things I've been saying to players forever. Hey, control what you can control. I have this little saying like, what's next? Like, hey, what's whatever happened? Good, bad. What's next? I literally had to wake up every morning and go. What's next? <laughs> Control yeah. what you so I, I am so clear minded now. Like, Hey guys, like all we're going to ask you guys to do, not be perfect. I'm not going to be perfect. I'm just be a lion every day, attack everything in your life. And that's really how I see it. So, you know, our core values are we want to be tough. We want to be hardworking. We want to be competitive. I mean, I want them to compete at everything they do. I want them to work hard and I want them to be tough. I want them to overcome, overcome the excuses of life and just attack everything in their lives. And so, if they are those three things, tough, hardworking, competitive, then we'll, big, we'll, we'll build a big physical team that's, that's sound and smart and accountable. I'm juiced up. Um, hey, when, hey, that was some fire shit. Yeah. <laughs> like, that was... I stole it, it from a book, though. I no, like I no, 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 no. You We've said, all, it, we you all said it with energy. Yeah. Yeah. Like, some people can just read a book and be like, oh, that's cool. But the way you said it, yeah. hey, the boys are going to play yeah. next year. Yeah. What were, when you did come into Nebraska, what were some things that you're like, all right, I'm going to have to, you know, address these things? Like, what were some issues coming into Nebraska that you identified that you, you want to hit head on? Yeah, and I, I think the biggest thing for me is making sure that all the, all the most up-to-date training and recovery modalities are part of our process. You know, like everything from, uh, uh, massage work, body work, to cupping, to scraping, to um, sensory deprivation tanks. Like, I really believe in all this stuff. I believe that one of my one of the most important jobs for me is to make sure my players are as healthy as possible. And the culture of recovery and regeneration, and all that. Like, either a schools have a bunch of stuff, but guys don't use it, or b they don't have it. And so I think you know one of the things I can do for these guys is really help them with that process. Like, the reason I had a chance to be a head coach in the NFL was because I had so many guys of mine that were kind of later round drafted guys that went to the NFL that were ready to be pros. And, you know, anybody can get you to the NFL, but who can, who can teach you how to be a pro? Like who can get it to where you get a second contract? One of my goals for my guys is to always make $5 million after the rookie contract. Like that Mm -hmm. to me is a goal. Like get through your rookie contract. Let's make 5 million more with your second contract. And then, then after that, it's all gravy. So I look at it like, how do I invest that into them? Well, I, I put all those, we have all these resources. Let's not spend them on waterfalls for recruiting. Let's spend them on things that can help our guys train, let's uh, recover, be as healthy as possible. And so that to me is something that if we do that at a high level, will really help our players because a healthy team wins a lot more games. And so um, that was one of the biggest things. And I just think, you know what, just, just being there for the guys, you know what I'm saying? Like at the end of the day, like at the end of the day, 
I didn't, I don't have to coach. Like I had four years left in my contract. I could have gone and done like a TV show maybe or played golf or something. I'm only coaching. Took a one, one way ticket to Thailand. Took a one right. way ticket. Do whatever you want. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Live your life. That's exactly yeah. right. So like I'm doing this because I truly feel like passionate about, hey, I want to work with young people and I want to do it at a place that, that, that jives with me. And that's why I found it in Nebraska. So I think the best thing I can do, man, is just really, Lock in with these guys because the hardest thing, and I said it to my fir the first time when I got hired, I said, hey, guys, listen, I, I know you guys, I know you guys didn't choose me. So I get that. So, but just remember this, I chose you. Um, I want to be here with you guys. So I hope you stay. Very few guys go into the portal. I'm not one of those. I didn't walk in and say, hey, y'all need to get in the portal. We're changing all this. Da -da. Those I'm guys. bringing that Louie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not bringing that back. I brought my own baggage. But, it's but Louie. Those guys. Mr. McCaffrey, welcome. Those guys care about, <laughs> those guys care about Nebraska, right? And, they, and they're yeah. good kids. Like, like my son's 18. He's going, all I want for my son at 18 is for him to go off and be around good people who care about him. That's yeah. all I want. So shouldn't I do the same thing for the guys I'm coaching and recruiting? I should be a good guy for them. Um, if you do that, you win games. Like everyone thinks, well, if I get this many stuff, if you treat young people right and, and and give them what they need to be successful, you'll be successful as a team. I believe that. I don't mean to put you on the spot with this, but ultimately that's what this question is. But a lot of recruits, and, and you know it, like you sit in houses, you sit in these, uh, you know, you sit in living rooms, talk to parents and talk about, I chose you. What does that mean when you could easily have, you know, maybe you get another opportunity to go back in the NFL after a couple of years. Or to Penn State, your alma yeah. mater. Yeah, or to Penn State, your alma mater. Yeah, sure. Yeah, Penn State, your alma mater after like a couple of years of dominating and winning two Big right. Ten Championships and Natties at Nebraska. Mm -hmm. What if those shiny new toys come into your life to want to pluck you out and go back to the NFL. Yeah. You know what I mean? I feel like a lot of guys, like, that's the whole big thing around the portal, right? It's a, it's a reason why players argue about all the NIL stuff and everything else. Coaches get these opportunities to come in. They establish themselves in the seat as a head coach. I know for me, you know, I, like, chose Nebraska because of the staff. And, like, hindsight, like, I've listened to Vrabel talk about it and everything else. You want to choose a school based on the school because you never know with some of the coaches. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, speak on that because I I know for me like I'll, you could you could easily get me to go somewhere because I'm like oh man I want to play for Bo Pliny but you know there are probably times where he might have left had yeah. he had the right opportunity. Right. I think it's really hard because you know I don't want to be a hypocrite because I've left twice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'll just say this like even after I left Temple I went back like the next day and watched practice or get ready for the bowl game and I had guys most of the guys um, were good with it they they understood like I came there. Um, we built up from two and 10. We went to the championship game. We, we lost. Um, I had a chance to take a bunch of jobs. I didn't, I came back, we finished the deal. We won the championship the next year. And I, I, I felt like I did, I, I left the place better than I found it. And I moved on to a, a new challenge, you know, to go to Baylor. And I think most of the guys were good with it, but it's still hard. Right. So I get that. I went to Baylor and it was like, okay, we took over a scandal ridden program. We went one and 11. Mm -hmm. And then we went six and seven and six. Then we went 11 and three, went to the sugar bowl. I went to the conference championship with the Sugar Bowl. So um, I think most times I've left, I've always gone for something like a, a step up in competition. Uh, so I think the guys got it, but I don't need to move anymore. You know, like I also have, I, I've, I've seen what it does to my kids and I've seen what it does to my family to have to, you know, like, you know, to, to have to move this many times. And so that was part of this deal was like, hey, where can we go and be for a while? Um, that being said, I have to answer that question for recruits because I've done it. I've done it a couple of times. Absolutely. Yeah. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't know that, I don't know that I'm, you know, I don't, I don't know that I'll ever go back to the NFL. I don't know that that's in my heart. Like I don't, I don't know if I'll ever reconcile the business part of it for me. Like it's just, it just was really hard for me to cut players and to be involved in that. Like it just, it just didn't connect with me. Like I thought it would. I loved when I was assistant online coach of the giants and I was just in the room with the fellas and Chris Snee and David deal and all those guys. I loved it. Like I mm -hmm. loved that brotherhood, that community in there. I did not, the role that I was in was really hard for me at Nebraska. I, I am, I am, I get to make the decisions, you know, that I can make along you with to Trevor, develop those guys. And I get to develop those guys and watch them grow. I think it's more who I was. I, I believe in transfer portal. I believe guys should have a chance to go where they want to go. I believe in NIL. I believe, I just think what happens is sometimes adults, we take advantage of a rule meant to help a young person. We, we, we turn it into something. It doesn't have to be like, but let's let's give guys an opportunity to make money off their name. Let's get give guys give guys an opportunity to go to school where they want to go to school. Let's just not abuse it. You know, we're supposed to be the adults. We're supposed to set a good example. Like I shouldn't be calling a guy in your roster saying, "Hey, come play for me." Like if he's happy there, let him be happy there. If mm -hmm. the guy's unhappy and he wants to go in the portal, fine. Um, All's fair in love and war, though. Yeah. Well, I mean, sometimes you got to do business as business is being done. Yeah, I, I'm with you. But like at the end of the day, like 
someone's going to come recruit your guys' kids someday, let's say. Mm-hmm. They're going to say, the first thing I say is, hey, I want to help you be the best man you can be. To, but then they start that off by, <laughs> the first thing they do is cheat. You know what I'm saying? I'm yeah. always like, like the money, the wins, it'll come and go. When we're all old, we'll look back and say like, you know, who was I? Not what did I do, but who, I really believe that. Who was I? And maybe it's good for me because as I said, I've been, I've won some coaching, coach of the year awards. I've been fired. I've seen both sides of it. And it's like, there has to be something more other than just this. Now I'm going to compete at the highest level. I'm going to do everything I can. I just think, you know, sometimes when we do this stuff, we, we, we tamper with a kid to come here. Or, you know, sometimes we mess their lives up. Sometimes we get them out of a good situation into a worse situation. And we're responsible for that as adults. So hopefully I'm doing it the right way. But it's really hard because there's, the lines are very blurred right now. And yeah. you know, what's legal, what's not. I just think, I'll do whatever I can to win in Nebraska as long as it's both legal and ethical. If I if I can live with it, if I can say that's that's the right thing to do, we have some rules. Like if I saw a junior in high school, I can't talk to him. I think that's that doesn't make any sense to me. I can do I can't do that, but his agent can call me and say he needs five hundred thousand dollars to come here. Like there's some rules that are antiquated. I'm not worried about those. I'm talking about um, you know making sure that we put in young people's their their best interest at heart. Are we really doing that or not? Like it, especially at a place like Nebraska, if you do that, the players I believe they will. They will lay everything down for, for the Cornhuskers to win if we do that. Mm, amen. So how, how do you navigate such a, such a gray area right now with NIL deals? Guys are getting money now. And I don't believe coaches can promise money, right? No, we can't, no. You can't promise money. No. But to get in Nebraska, we've talked about this in the podcast, to get mm-hmm. Nebraska to where it used to be, there's got to be more of a selling point than Lincoln because it's the internet lives. You can see Miami. And, and these really nice climate areas and guys will look at Nebraska in the wintertime. I've been there seven degrees. It's freezing. So how do you sell these kids in a legal way to come to Nebraska to be great? You guys, you're, 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 you're think I'm giving you coaching answers, but uh, I really, I, no, first off, I think you're doing a phenomenal, like I, this, this podcast has truly fired me up. So, so I, I don't, th- I don't try to convince anybody anymore to come mm-hmm. because no one's going to convince me to come. Right. I just try to tell people like what our plan is for them and what we have. Like, here's what we have. Here's our plan for you. Like, I think we do. I'll just say this. Like, it, when I talk to recruits, especially guys who are thinking about transfer, I'm like, if you want to be a lawyer, do you go to medical school? No. If you want to be a, a doctor, a doctor, do you go to law school? No. So if you want to play in the NFL, why wouldn't you go somewhere that's going to prepare you for the NFL? So, like, mm-hmm. if you want to go play uh, D-line in the National Football League, well, come play for Terrence Knighton, who played for eight years. Pot Rose, D-line, baby. Pot Rose. Go. Pot Rose has still, he still shows his Bridgestone commercial every chance he gets. <laughs> and, 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 co- and coached in the NFL. Like, go play for us with him. Our strength coach came from the NFL. I, like, like go somewhere that's going to prepare you for that. So I think us doing a really good job of showing people, here's our plan for you. Ac- everyone can talk. Everyone can talk slick. Like, here's our plan for you academically. Mm-hmm. Here's our plan for you socially. Here's our plan for you. And then the great recruiting has not changed in that when the current players on the team tell you, hey, they mean what they say you're going to win. Yeah. You see a lot of schools having mass exoduses because they got promised maybe a lot. And the coach players are like, Hey, don't come here. They're not doing what they said. I don't mind if a player doesn't like what I say, but I can't live in a world where they say, well, coach lied to me. Mm-hmm. Like, you can be disappointed with what I said. Um, I might be wrong, but I'm not going to lie to you. And I think that's, again, when you get to year 11 and you have sort of the stability that I have, like, why do I, why do I ask for an eight year contract? Because I, I don't want to have to bow to the whims of like, well, if I don't win this game, we're out after year two. I want to have the time not because I think we're not going to win right away, but I want the stability that people can say, I'm going to come there and play for him and um, mm-hmm. I can do things the right way. But I just think if, if I do a good job with the current players, the more players will come. And you know, it's, it's, but it's also about finding the right guys. It's about finding guys that know, Hey, this is what Lincoln, I'm not lying to you. I'm bringing guys in. I got guys on visits right now. It's, it, oh, it's actually 50 today, by the way, but it was cold yeah. the last couple of days and like, Hey, this is what it is, man. Like, can you do it or not? Like I'll, what happens when you get drafted by Cleveland? What are you going to do then? Like, if you can't handle this, then you, Probably not right for us because I, I, going back to what I said before, I want guys who are lions. Like if you're worried about this, that, and the third, then you're probably not right for me because I'm worried about I want to win and I want to see you get a degree and I want to see us win a championship. Like you'll see sometimes I, I, my emoji game is a degree, a ring, and, you know, I tried to find a shield one time saying like I, that, those are three things I want for you. Like have a great time, get an education, win a ring, and, and go off and get drafted in the NFL and make a ton of money, $5 million after your first contract. Let's talk about your emoji game. What got you in the emoji game, the secret emojis? Because Dave Porno would hit me up and be like, hey, I think it could be a, it could be a tough look for uh, Coach Rule not, not knowing what your age is, but he's out there tweeting emojis. I don't know if he'll be able to compete with Michigan. Michigan ain't out there tweeting emojis. So this is your opportunity to talk about your emoji game because you got a little subtle. Yeah, I'll just say uh, uh, I got recruits asking me to at them, like, 
Like I, I, well, I can say people's names now, right? So Malachi Coleman goes on his visit to another school. He comes back the last night. You can come see as he comes in. Went the, to Colorado. Okay. I, I'm trying not to say too much. But <laughs> yeah. I got my back on that. I don't want anybody. I don't want. I don't want any smoke. <laughs> yeah. I don't want any problems. But but no, he comes in. He, and he play ping pong. Right. I'm, I'm a big believer in ping pong. I think like you have to put your phone down when you play it. Right. You can't have your earphones in when you play it. Right. Like I just seen it transform locker rooms. Like you know. So I, was, I I put ping pong tables in the lounge. Everything like like to me everything goes from like no nah, I don't really talk to him. All of a sudden like. You're good and you're good. Oh, let's play each other, right? So, like, I love the game. So, I I play him. I beat him. And he's like, Coach, hey, tweet tweet that out. But tweet it in emoji. So, you know what? I, I got a lot of people. A lot of people have been kind of fired up about it. I'm kind of— That's I how it to, started. Yeah. Well, and if you go back to Baylor, I would do it every once in a while. Like, when I had a subtle hint for maybe another coach, something like, you know, I'm never going to talk trash, but, like, but sometimes I have to, like, I'm not a sheep either, right? So, I can't. Yeah. If I feel like you're coming at me in the wrong way in recruiting, I, I would maybe do something that they could kind of get. But uh, so I've been trying to do, I've been trying to just do it a little bit here and there, but haters are going to hate. People are going to say haters whatever, you know, it is what it is. Um, That's what happens when you're fucking popping. Yeah, the emojis are the modern day Morse code. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you out there putting doing. out descriptions <laughs> and trying to decipher. Hey, you hear him talking about the ping pong tables? Yeah. There's always headlines each year where there's a new coaching staff or something where there could be ping pong tables in a locker room. They get taken out, yada, 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 and so yeah. on. You're kind of the first coach. I mean, I, we had him in Washington, but you're kind of the first coach I've heard be like, oh, I'm pro- I get a ping pong table and what are we talking about? Like, you know what? You lose because someone jumps off sides or someone drops the ball. The coach tries to be clever and comes up with 10 new plays. Like, mm. like, don't we want guys like, don't we want guys to be around each other? Like, and that's hard now in the era of phones sometimes. So like you have everyone looking at their phone. So anything I can do, whether it's food, whether it's golf, whether it's my first two years in the NFL was COVID. Like this past year, I was able to like go out and play golf with Shaq Thompson and Christian and, Corbett, Johnny Hecker, who might be the, one of the coolest dudes ever to hang out with. Like, you know how much fun that was just to get to know them as people after like, the craziness of COVID? So why I missed that so much. You know, you go to the NFL and COVID, it was so hard. Like, I, I want I, I want to come there. I want to spend time with the guys. I don't want to sit in my office all day, like, looking at a computer. I want to I want to hang out with the fellas, right? I'm always going to be the coach. And and I'm, all, I'm 47, almost 48. Like, I'm never going to be... But I'm not going to try to relate on things I can't relate on. But yeah. let's go compete. I'll, I'll I'll fight you to the death on the ping pong table. If you're going to play racquetball, I'll fight you to the death. Like, yeah. I want you to compete. I'm going to compete with you. And that, to me, builds some relationships. I tell you what, you want to see some chaos in a locker room, get a kid's basketball hoop and some mini basketballs. Kids will go <laughs> no off. Doubt, no doubt. We, we, put a, we also took a tape down. We made like four square. Oh. We started using the basketballs. Lines out the door during camp. Yep. Out the door. Yeah, dude. P dudes love the ping pong. The they love the table. ping pong. Tressway is the best ping pong player I've ever seen play. Really? Ever ever seen. Really? Yeah. Tressway, the punter. You sound Washington. like you're kind of good, though. I, yeah. Are I'm you like pretty that? good. I'm, I'm when, when we were in Carolina, like, I, I, Christian was better than me. Andre Roberts. Oh, Andre Roberts, scratch golfer. And then elite ping pong player. Then, like, the specialist. But, I don't, you know, J.J. Jansen. But I don't know if they count because they're not going to meetings, really. Right? Right, so, like, yeah, yeah. They're playing all day. I mean, yeah. J.J.'s an elite Do you golfer. hate those guys the most during camp? Well, I mean, they just, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. you know. No, dude. Yeah. Johnny, we had no. guys at Michigan, like, go to the movies. And I'm, like, <laughs> dying in a 2.30 meeting. Like, fuck, dude. <laughs> this is awful. Johnny Hecker's over there putting, you know. I mean, he, he's an elite golfer. So, but I'm I'm pretty good. Not great. I'm pretty good. Um not the plan. In that case, there's a table over here, and I'm gonna try to suck. No, it no, 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 no. I'm pretty good. You, you yeah. whooped my ass. I'm not like that on the ping pong table. I wish I was. No, I can't uh, play pool. I can't. I can't. That, that, Billiards or anything? Yeah, I just, I, I just can't make it go. They well got with a you. nice uh, little players lounge in Nebraska. They do. Yeah. That is a nice little Papa shot thing too. Yeah, yeah. They got something. all the bells and whistles. We would circle around the big. Uh, what's it called? The big TV. What's it called? It pulls down projector. Nice. We'd circle around the projector on those couches, and we'd be playing back when it was like Percy Harvin on the Gators. Uh, <laughs> Percy Harvin on the Gators, you'd play the punt return mode on NCAA. I think it was 14, right? I don't uh, I mean, Percy might have been sooner than that, but Players Lounge, man, some good old times there. Mm. You get some um, old Xboxes, and then that'd be fun. You should get NCAA 14 for all the guys. <laughs> they would love that. That's so much Should've fun. Coming back at some point here soon, or no? I think it's NCAA. 2024, right? I just want to be sick. Bill Walsh's college football, me uh, at Penn State in 1997. I played with 83 Auburn, Bo Jackson, unstoppable. I was, I was, <laughs> was about his game. A long time. A long time. What, um, how has, 
you were in college before you went to the NFL, obviously. Now you're back in college. The world's completely changed with the NIL. How how eye-opening, how have you been navigating those waters, being like, holy fuck, this is... It seems to me like it's a free agency 24-7 at the college level. Yeah. Like, it's not even it's not even NFL world where you have three-year contracts that you can't break whether you overperform Wolves. or not. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's the Wild West of college football yeah. right now, yeah. I think, um, you know, it, it, it's hard for me to say because I'm just getting started with it. I think as I go through a couple of years, it'll be... I'll probably have a better feel for, you know, exactly what I think about everything. Um, at its core, I believe in it, right? Like, I, it's funny. I was, I was talking to RG3, like, a couple weeks ago. I was like, can you imagine if they would have had this when you played? How much oh money he would have made? Oh, my God, he makes so oh, much dude. money. Like, dude, he, he, he would have, I mean, it would have been, it would have been insane. So, yeah. at its core, I believe in it. Um, you know, I, I one thing I've said is I want guys to get taken care of as long as they're coming for the right reasons. Because, you know, I know this. I know how hard I'm going to work. I'm expect my staff to work for each guy, like as a person, like to give them what they need. And so I want them to want that. They, they got to want the football. They got to want the academic. If they want all that, then if they get taken care of, you know, over here, then great. Um, I'm all for it. You know, I'm also a guy that kind of wants everyone to get taken care of. Like I watched for, you know, I, I walked on at Penn State. I was never a great player. So probably I have a soft spot in my heart for guys who walk on. But I always see those dudes out there doing everything everyone else is doing. And they're paying to go to school. And I'm like, man, I wish, you know, I like, I see some schools are, t you know, do, using some of that NIL money to, help those guys, which I think is beautiful for a locker room. Because mm -hmm. um, you, you guys know this, but I say this to recruits all the time. The NFL is so crazy. It's the only job in the world where, like, the left guard and the right guard or the left corner and the right corner, they both have the same work schedule. They both have the same assignments. They both have the same practice. They both have the same risk to bodily injury. But yet, this guy, this left guard plays for $18 million, and this guy plays for $660,000. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm a, if I stop at Chick-fil-A on the way out of here, like, this one woman doesn't work for $120 an hour, and this guy works for 12 Like, it doesn't work that way anywhere else in the world, but it works that way in football. And so, like, they need to learn early about value. Like, hey, you're going to get paid, and your value in the NFL is going to come off of what you did in college. Like, Brian Burns was all pro for us as a third-year player. We didn't, they, didn't, they didn't give him a raise. <laughs> he yeah. was playing off his rookie deal. So you got to play well in college to make money in the NFL. you got to play well your first four years to make money on your second contract. So... I think learning about value is pretty good. Um, but I just like it when everyone, you know, if, if everyone could kind of get taken care of and guys learn how to manage their money right, you know, if you invest money at 22, 23, 24, 25, your life could be pretty good at 60 and 65. So when done right with responsible, you know, adults helping, hopefully, hopefully it can be really good. Can you guys put things in place to help with financial stuff or does that have to be from a third party? No, we can do all that. We can do education. Uh, we can do a ton of it and our people have done it. You know, our, our people uh, uh, at Nebraska are working really hard to have a really good, you know, I, for me, like I, I didn't know much about finances, you know, in college. I yeah. kind of just got a credit card and all of a sudden was like, oh, wow, this the debt ma ma piles up quickly, you know. So I wish I would have done a better job. I was but, a general studies major. I had no, I still don't know what's going on. <laughs> I'm doing the best I can. But yeah, and I'm with you. You know what I'm saying? So I, I think you know, we're, we, can, we can do all that stuff. You can provide all, uh, all that education. And then, you know, I, I like it when guys learn how to go out and be entrepreneurs and, and, and market themselves. The true meaning of NIL, like, hey, go, go, go start something, you know, go, go build your brand so that you have something after football. Mm -hmm. Did you always have this mindset or is this like a, because you're changing with the times? Because it's a very new age coach mindset. You said you're an old school guy. You want to run the ball, play good defense. But for a coach, a head coach to sit here and be like, I want guys to market themselves. I want, when we were in college, it was, what are you guys doing on Twitter? You don't need to, you don't need to be on that. Yeah, Bo almost took it from us like a couple times. Yeah, and so now it's become like, hey, you guys need to be on this and do it, just do it smart. And yeah. like, how, has that been a, a, a thing for you that you're like, guys should market themselves or has that changed over time? It's probably changed a little bit. I think there's something to it. Like I'll still see, I'll see like a player who keeps retweeting every fan who says something good about him. Like, you know, here's where I'm ranked. I'm like, bro, what are you doing? Like, just worry about playing football. Like, mm. I don't necessarily mean that. Like, where you're just, because kind of what I talked about before, like, if you only see your value based upon what other people say about you, I just mean, like, build a business. Uh, build, build, build connections. You know, you want to get you want to get into music. You want to get into fashion. You want to get into education. Whatever you want to get into, like, build that brand. But just, just make sure you're also handling football first. And make sure you're yeah. handling your education first. Yeah. Like, those things, because your ultimate brand will come off of what you do, right? Like what you do on the football field, what you do in the classroom. So let's build that. But on the side, I think it's awesome when guys learn these things. And, you know, part of it is like the minute, you know, as you guys know, the minute you start getting paid in the NFL, then then when the time comes, they're going to try to take the money away from you. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Like you're good. At, I've seen guys making $8 million. All of a sudden they're cutting, they're signing a, a minimum deal. You have to learn how, you have to learn all that now. And I probably didn't understand this probably as much 
before I went to the NFL. And um, I'm so glad we can't get involved in NIL because I think, you know, a guy has a contract he doesn't like walking in the locker room, a guy you pay someone else instead of him. I was really glad that I wasn't handling all that. So when guys walk in the locker room, I'm like, wasn't me, bro. It's these guys over here. Right. And I also going back to me you on know, my ability to move. Like I, I make a lot of money. Our coaches make a lot of money. Mm-hmm. So it's hard for me to say, I'm going to make a lot of money, but Hey, I don't want the players getting anything. That just doesn't seem yeah. right to me. I mean, football's opened up doors. I never thought I would have. I want the doors open for my guys as well. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you said some. You've said some before, but it's like you know, guys retweeting what people say about them, your perception, and everything else. You live for the cheers, you die by the booze. It's like the the moment you do have a bad game and you are feel feeding into that stuff. It's going to affect your psyche, which is something that you were alluding to earlier when sitting and having conversations with Matt on guys like feeling like they're under a lot of pressure and everything else. But are you surprised um, by some of the, I guess how naive guys can be like high school recruits on thinking like you're going to go in thinking you're going to go in and meet somebody, sit down and talk a little bit of shop, but how quickly it gets to money. Um, you know, I, I think, I think a lot of the high school kids have been really good. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, some, you know, I guess it's some guys, some people get involved with some of those people. I just think, um, you know, if I tell you, I'm not going to talk money with you. I'm not going to talk, I'm your coach. I'm not going to talk money with you. You know what I mean? So I just think I have to have that discipline. Um, but I think it's, I think probably where you see more of the NIL stuff happening is with, within people's own rosters. And, you know, as, as people come in and say, Hey, leave your, that roster. And then, um, but also with the transfers, you know, and, and I'll be honest with you, I, like, like, you know, you guys talked about Garrett uh, Nelson earlier, right? Like Garrett's a guy that, you know, could have maybe come back or could go off to the NFL. Like, you know, maybe NIL can help a guy like that. Hey, if I do come back, I get, I, I get taken care of pretty good because I could be making money in the NFL. I was, I was fired up for Garrett about his decision. I, I you know, I was happy for him. he, he was first class and did everything the right way. But, mm-hmm. you know, there's times where if you have a draftable grade and you're thinking about coming back, if the NIL people or some people want to take care of you, I think that, that makes total sense to me. Um, but you know how recruiting is. Like, one guy's completely different from the next. And right. just trying right, to find right. people who really want to come for, you know, what it used to be. You know yeah. what I mean? Maybe, like, I, maybe I phrased that wrong, but have you came across those situations where you're like, okay, it seems like his head's kind of in oh, a different 100%. space. Oh, 100%. I'm from, sorry. Right, where you're going to hit somebody up like, hey, he's – you hit up, you know, T night. You were seeing a D lineman. You're like, hey, he's not a type of guy. Yeah, we 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 say, oh, you. You'll see us say, oh, it's like one of us. Like, like you know, I I don't. I tell the guys all the time. I don't care what. I don't, Thank you, brother. I don't care. I don't care how you carry your hair. I don't care. You know what music you listen to. I don't care how you dress. I care about how you do your football. How you treat people and fo- so. If I come across somebody that's not about that, they're just not going to be a good fit. Like, yeah, I've learned my lesson. I made too, way too many mistakes early on trying to chase people, getting seduced by talent. So. Um, if someone's not, you know, again, and I, again, I draw the distinction between the transfer guys who've proven what they can do and incoming freshmen, like if an incoming freshman is talking to me about all this other stuff. Like we should be talking about our study hall structure. <laughs> like, like, you know, you got to prove some things before, yeah. you know, I want to, and again, we stay out of that, but I do, I do think that, yes, there's a lot of people that they want to know what's in it for them and they want to know what it is. And that's only natural. I just think as a coach, you have to say, this is how we're going to do it. I don't talk about this. You know, I talk about the school, and then if if you're interested, then you know, talk to these people over here. Yeah, if there's opportunities for you. Then great. You know, I think it's gonna be fucking crazy in a couple of years. Yeah, I think the the way it's it gonna seems, be wild. Yeah, uh, but the next couple of years are gonna be crazy because it seems like uh, the Big Ten and the SEC especially are like kind of just taking as many colleges as possible. Like the thought of the UCLA and USC being in the Big Ten five ten years ago would be just blasphemous. It'd be ridiculous. How do you think the college landscape's going to change? If you really are going to be at Nebraska for eight years, you're probably going to see it. Uh, do you see? Do you think there's an opportunity that the Big Ten and the SEC and maybe one other big conference splits away from the NCAA with all this new NIL stuff, go, uh, NIL stuff going on and making their own like league almost? You know, that, that's a great question. I've heard people say that. I don't. I don't know that. I do think. I do think to your point. I think the Big Ten has kind of become like this coast to coast, almost like yeah. college is NFL, you know I mean? We, from 2024, from Pes- it will be coast yeah, to coast. Pes- yeah. Pes- yeah. To, to, UC- to LA, like Pes- we Pes- got Pes- everything in between. So um, it becomes a really national brand. And that's, I think that's actually kind of good for us. Like when I look at like, when I look at like Texas, I went Nebraska to be Texas's big 10 team. When I look at like West of here, mm. um, all the way till you, there's all those prospects from Arizona to Utah in between Arizona. that, that doesn't have, that doesn't have a, uh, that doesn't have a place to go if they want to play in the Big Ten. And so as the Big Ten, they go to as we go to 16 teams and the Big Ten's getting three to four teams in every year to the college football playoff, hey, come to Nebraska. I think that's one of the things I saw in the SEC, certainly the SEC. And then yeah, we, we have to defeat them. Yeah. We got to beat them. I think something like that helps Nebraska because I, in my opinion, 
I loved, like I got to play two years in the Big 12, two years in the Big 10. I loved when we got to go to the Big 10, but now hindsight, I almost feel like it hurt us to go to the Big 10 because we became, we recruited so much for uh, California, especially Texas. And I know coaches now think, thinking about it from the coach's perspective, you're sitting in these living rooms in Texas and being able to at least tell families, you'll be able to see these guys play a couple times a year at Baylor, at Texas Tech, A&M at the time. Mm -hmm. You'll be able to see them. And then, you know, you can still come to Nebraska. Now Nebraska before UCLA and USC's join it, it's kind of like you're going to fly over Michigan, Ohio, you know, all this, all these states just to play at Nebraska. And you can't necessarily recruit Texas as well because like, oh, we don't play there at all anymore. Right. So I feel like getting to the West Coast, like USC and UCLA, that helps Nebraska a little bit more because now if you're recruiting, you know, California and the West Coast a little bit more, you'll at least be able to say, hey, we're closer than all these other fucking big time schools, you know, on the East. And, pl and plus, like when I was at Baylor, I could tell people like, hey, nine out of our 11, uh, nine of our 12 games or 10 out of our 12 games this year are in the state of Texas. Well, that's going to change. You know, the big 12 is changing. Now they're bringing in Cincinnati and some other teams. So now you are leaving the state every year. And now yeah. even, you know, Texas and Texas A&M, now as they go into the SEC, they're playing in Alabama, they're playing in Georgia. So all of college football is pretty, becoming pretty regional. Like I, I'm old school, man. I miss like, Pitt, Penn State, and then I miss, you know, uh, uh, Nebraska playing Colorado, Nebraska OU. Like, I miss all the old school games, you know, but it's what's happened. It is what it is, right? So I think this this move with USC and UCLA coming in, the Big Ten moving up, the conf the, the playoff expanding to 12 teams, it's, it's, uh, it's the perfect time for, for Nebraska, it's the perfect time for us. It's one, one of the major reasons I was like, I see an opportunity here. Yeah. Now, let's start with some, you know, early little bit of fun. You brought up Nebraska, Colorado. That rivalry gets to kind of reignite itself this year. Dion is now at Colorado. There's a lot of fluff there, wasn't it? Not wasn't it amusing seeing the AD beg for Colorado fans to like, please let's yeah. not let the red yeah, don't let the red hey, sink in. The, hey, the yeah. red travels now. Yeah, the well, red wasn't it nice sitting back and kind of seeing them like? I, I tell you what, I groveling. Let's start a little early trash talk. I I there's a picture. There's a thing in our media guide of all the different pictures mm -hmm. of us taking over stadiums. Yeah, in the sea of red and, and traveling, and I just. You know, I, you know I've, I've, I've worked at some great places, but I've never had that. Like, I've never had that home field advantage, that road advantage. So I can't wait for it. You know, I can't wait to, to have that chance. And I think, you know, it's funny. I have so much respect for Dion. But, like, our last official visit weekend, they had they have the uh, Madden and Xbox, whatever, on. They have two. And it's like, it's, 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 it says Prime on there. And I'm like, guys, take off. The, we're trying to beat Colorado on recruits. They're like, coach, it's Madden. What are we going to do? He's, he's on the cover of Madden as it scrolls through the thing. I'm like, Damn. It's kind of hard to beat uh, with one of the greatest football players of all time. No, yeah. So, but but you know what? Um, I'm sure players, he'll do a great though, job there. Players though might not be best coach of all time. Well, and you know I'm, I'm sure and he's done a great job. I just now I will say <laughs> this. I will say this. I I, uh, I but I believe in our staff. I believe what we're doing, and we're gonna you know we're gonna put it together and go out there and play. It'll be a great game. I think it'll be a great thing for. I think it's a great thing for college football though. Like Nebraska, Colorado. Like when I was going through this process, showing my wife and my son, like you know that. 80s and 90s and those rivalries and coach McCartney and coach Osborne and just those are some great games man and so like to have this game and I think we're the last two times we played them like rowing two against them you know in the last two games against Colorado so um you know to start off at Minnesota and then come back and go with two Colorado that's yeah that's gonna be fun that's gonna yeah. be a great challenge, yeah. nice little warm up with Minnesota yeah. the Gophers dude yeah <laughs> so. hey it was funny though about that AD begging right it was it was funny You're trying to get me in trouble bro <laughs> <laughs> You don't have to, uh, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll ask you easier question. Do you fully expect Nebraska to go into Colorado and totally have a sea of red in Boulder? I expect our fans to show up. Oh, oh yeah. there he yeah. is, baby. Yeah. Let's go. There he is. I, I'll be there. I or I'll fucking, I'll be there. And let's go. I expect our fans to show up. I, uh, as I've gotten out to the Western part of the state and seeing all the, 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 the like the die hard, die hard, like I'm in, I'm in Scotts Bluff and we're at a little brew pub downtown and there's, People figured out that we were there, me and my, the OC, and all of a sudden there were just people there, like, shaking our hand. Like, those people those people out there, they're excited about Nebraska football. So I think it's – I'm hoping that people come from everywhere. And then I, I'll be honest with you, I can't wait for our first home game. You know, uh, Northern Illinois, like, I, like, I just mm. can't wait to walk – I walk by that field in the mornings. You know, I get into work whatever time and walk out there, man. It's like, I'm going to coach here, like. And it's kind of like humbling, like, and also like, hey, you better get your ass Loud to work. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, make sure we're ready to go because I, I want those people to see a team they that they that they really like. Mm -hmm. You um, you talked about good football players in Arizona. There's some studs out there right now. <laughs> There's some really good players. You know, would you say Arizona is probably a top five state in recruiting? <laughs> I say it's it's pretty important. Um, 
pretty important. There's, there's a we lot, had an, a lot we had of an argument players. about where the best players come from. Yeah, it's pretty important for us right now. Yeah, Arizona's pretty important for Nebraska. State of Arizona is a really good place for us. You know, a lot of people from Nebraska have second homes there or you know, vacation there. I found so. out when Will came into town, there was yeah, damn parades going do. down yeah, the road. Do. So it's 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 a, it's a it's an easy trip, and so it's uh it's, they got it's some good place. quarterbacks in Arizona. Yeah, they you know Kyler, I'm a big Kyler Murray fan. Yeah, excellent player. Yeah, absolutely. yeah, and you know at all levels, you know college, uh, high, school, high school, absolutely. Yeah. Some VR, good players. Yeah. all levels. Yeah, at all levels. Hypothetically, I think we got to go all in on whoever the number one recruit is. Like best. Yeah, I think I think Nebraska. I think Nebraska should. I think Nebraska should recruit the best of the best, and also let guys know that what an unbelievable opportunity to come be. You know, like I want to be one of the people that you know brings us to glory. And so the players that choose to come here in this class and maybe like next year's class, they're the ones who who I think people will remember for a long time. Like, hey, the state wants us. You want us. Everyone that loves Nebraska wants us to be great again. So um, let's 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 get the right players and coaches here, and people will remember those guys. Yeah, the Nebraska. Good answer. Hey, you are playing an excellent game of chess right now. I will now. say this. Can I say one thing? Yeah. Because Jalen Petrie, just, I think he just set the NFL record for Jalen for uh, played, second round draft pick for the Texans, played for me at Baylor, then played for Coach Aranda. Uh, he was the only player that stayed committed in the, in the recruiting class um, after the scandal had happened at Baylor. And I got there. I didn't even know him. Hmm. And I introduced myself to him. I remember the two tour guys were walking with him. And the one tour, tour guy started crying. And she was like, I just want you to know, <laughs> like, I know you're the only person that – when everyone else left the program, you're the only kid who stayed. And so he will someday probably have a statue built for him at Baylor because he's the guy who bridged the gap. He's the, he's the one. Like, I got some credit. that No, he's the one. And now he set an NFL record this year as a rookie. He's a special, special person. So that sense of legacy, it's – we go to a place like Nebraska and you walk by the All-Americans, you walk by the Heisman – I mean, it's pretty hard. Like, I used to walk through the halls of Penn State like, well, I'll never be the first to do anything here. We've done it all. But when your, your program hits a little bit of adversity, the people who show up now, um, kind of like Jalen did at Baylor, they'll, they'll remember you for a long, long time. Right. They're like a quarterback who could be sitting out there somewhere in any state on the West. Could yeah. be Arizona. Arizona's a top five recruiting yeah, school or a recruiting state. You'd be part of some legacy type shit. Legacy stuff. Do you dude. understand? I think you're like, you're obviously going to say yes, but do you truly understand how rabid these fans are in Nebraska? Um. Uh, if no. not go back and watch some old pressers from Bo Pelini, just some old school shit. Like you gotta, yeah. you gotta buckle in around Lincoln, Nebraska. Yeah, keep yeah. your hands in the cart at all times during the ride type <laughs> yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think, I think, but I, I do believe this. I believe, um, like I said, after everything I've gone through, the good and the bad, I think that's got me to this point where I'm like as, as stoic and as zen as possible. Like I was on the plane the other day, uh, flying. You know, I flew uh, back from Charlotte from the coaches convention and commercial. Uh, commercial yeah okay, absolutely and I, and I was i was fortunate that i was able to sit up group four <laughs> <laughs> and, and they started chanting go big red as we were landing in omaha and i was like oh this is real okay um so but you Damn, know what bro you want, i would much rather have passion than apathy and knowing that on both sides of it there can always be you know sometimes it could be but i've met a lot of really great people and i think i think people in nebraska right now are so starved to like just like let's just go see what a go back to a bowl game like let's just do that like so I, I can feel people are getting excited about hey we're gonna do this for this i'm trying to stay in the moment like did everyone go to community service today you know <laughs> did everyone go to fo- for practice everyone showed up at lifting this morning that's great let's stay in that like that kind of that space but i'm excited about what maybe we can do you know yeah it's like it's almost like that's what nebraska just wants to do again you thought everybody thought we had it with scott with like him, him playing in the 90s him being a successful coordinator head coach coming to nebraska we got our fucking guy and for it to not happen it's kind of like fuck man Mm. like what is even the expectation anymore you know what i mean no i thought you were gonna cry for a second you almost do it's like you come into this job and it's like somebody takes on this responsibility because a lot of people would argue that it's a fucking hard job to want to go into because the expectation is so high and you already alluded to it the, the little apathy quote you had passion over apathy it's like the expectation is so high and recruiting can be a little dicey because you're trying to get these kids to middle America again. When you can play anywhere, it's it's like, I'm excited. I'm excited. And you texted your boy like on day one. Mm. Like it, Coach Rule texted on like, I, I think day one, day Will, two. Will texted me the minute he texted, you texted him. Oh, I was like, hey, brother, guess <laughs> hey, brother. what? <laughs> it's like the president gets, he, he becomes the president the first 100 days. It's like on your list, get in with the boy. That's it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? That's it. 
Was uh, that on the list? It was 100 percent on the list. Yeah. Probably number probably number one on the list. <laughs> yeah. uh, calling my wife and making sure <laughs> yeah. Yeah. she was in on it. But it was in the top five. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. Oh shit. Uh, but, uh, but no, in all seriousness, was, like as we went through this process, um, we had so much time. Like I watched all these things. I watched all the tunnel walks. I watched Coach Bellini. I watched Coach Osborne. I, I watched Coach So I watched all these different things. But I watched you guys. I watched I I, I went I went back and watched when you guys had Coach Pellini on here. Like I watched, I, I, I had a chance to really immerse myself and say, okay, Matt is, you know, cause I'm, when I go in, I go in, I go all in, like mm. I go all in. I was like, are you ready to go all in on this? And, um, but you guys were part of that process for me. That's why being here is honestly, it's unbelievably cool because, um, I get to talk about Nebraska. I get to do it in a way that's fun. And I get to talk about football and I get to kind of laugh at myself a little bit, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I got to see that from you guys. And that's important to me. You know what I'm saying? You, you can, you can lose yourself. When you when you have when you're a coach, you can lose yourself and think you're too important. You know what? Like, let's let's just let's just be ourselves. Yeah, I feel uh, like from a I, first I impression that. standpoint, like I have never met you. Today's the first day you and I have talked. I like you, well, and you. I feel like if I'm a recruit, <laughs> I'm watching this and like I fucking like that guy too. <laughs> like you got high energy, you're passionate, you're ready to get after it. You know what the kind of football you want to play. You talk about your lows. Yeah, yeah, and that's a huge thing too. It's because people like to run away from their mishaps or things that happened that didn't go their way you're you're facing it head on yeah you're the spear bud you're the spear <laughs> for no, the Nebraska no, Cornhuskers my favorite thing you said about watching Bussin is like you're like you know did I get caught up or wrapped up and seeing people laugh at themselves I think it's super important man because yeah. mm -hmm. you can get lost no doubt in the identity of like I'm here man everybody's fucking coming after me tearing yeah. me down like you know you said what do I do to, you know take my kids to school or go home and pout I'm sure you did both you probably took them to school and fucking yeah, that's oh right. my god <laughs> yeah pout on the way home <laughs> yeah pout yeah. just some busting with the boys no, baby no doubt yeah dude because it, it, there, we talk about all the time like there's people that either are on pedestals or put themselves on pedestals and just refuse to take a giggle at themselves knowing they fucked up and it's oh, yeah. like dude if you just do that life the anxiety of life no dwindles no doubt and you feel so much better now, I do have a very important, this might be the most important question. This might be Ooh. not the rowback, but this is definitely a massively important question. Sure. And the way you answer it is going to change the directory of our friendship. I don't know how you <laughs> and Will are going to be. The fourth game this season, you will, play, you will be playing the Michigan Wolverines in Lincoln, Nebraska. Now, there are talks that last year, Michigan won the first inaugural bus and bowl. Official or unofficial, that's the argument that people are putting at it, putting up with it. Are you willing to sign papers saying that Mich or Nebraska will be playing for the first official bus and bowl against Michigan next year? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll sign that. Here's what I do. You we'll know, a lawyer you, writes something up right now. History of the bus and bowl. I'm, I'm not. I'm not. So, <laughs> yeah. so we we did the spring tour last year sure. where we went to uh, we went to Nebraska, we went to Michigan, we went to Tennessee. Okay. We did interviews, sat down with Scott, Coach Chins, uh, Trev Alberts. He's been on the bus. I, we That's went it. to that Michigan game the last year. And uh, we were sitting down on the spring tour, and Taylor was like, hey, I got an idea. And talked about, like, hey, I'm going to ask if we can do the bus and bowl. Like, I'm going to ask Scott Frost if he'll say yes. He got fired up, said yes. We went to Michigan. Scott was like, look, if RAD's on board and Michigan's on board, I'm all for it. Like, let's sign it. We go to Michigan. Do Harbaugh. Have, hold on. Do we have the clip? He's grabbing it. He's grabbing. Well, do, do you have the, Do you have the clip of uh, Harbaugh? He's grabbing the. Uh, he's grabbing the contract. He, yeah, he's grabbing the contract right now. So go ahead, Will. You. This is your. This um, is your story. We go to Michigan and we ask Harbaugh, and Harbaugh's all about it. We have our legal team draw up a, a document <laughs> to to make this thing official. Jim Harbaugh is the only guy who assigned it. He was all in. He was hitting his chest like he was getting into. You felt it. Yep. He's all yeah. about competing, Passion. just like yourself. We'd love to see a ping pong game there. Um, but he signed it. Along the way, it got lost a little bit in translation. I, I'm, you, I, I like to feel like I'm connected at Nebraska, and I was told that we would get this thing signed. Training camp kind of got away from all of us for a little bit. You know, you got your 10 up in the air. Mm -hmm. Where are we going here? Where are we going there? I was in training camp. And unfortunately, Nebraska had the year that they had. I tried making it happen knowing that it's like this probably isn't going to get signed because there's – so many more important things going on than signing a document to make the bus and bowl official when Nebraska's like losing game in game out. And so our side didn't necessarily sign it. Got it. So Taylor now, and I, Harbaugh signed it before we even finished the question. Yeah, that's right. Signed it before we even finished the question. And so 
Taylor and I still took it upon ourselves, like we're gonna still make this thing unofficially official, but we're going to go to Michigan, bring the trophy, mass, it's 40 pounds, it's sitting in, it's sitting in the Michigan locker room in their trophy case. Right next to Paul Bunyan. Show you gotta show I'm, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll pull it up right now. All right, we can cut, we can you, cut this well, you can, you can uh, is there anything else you wanna say? Will? No, I want him to see that it's, this is a, this is a living, what breathing that thing. That would happen in November? Yeah. Duke Cannon sponsored the trophy. We have a full-on trophy made with little, you know, them little things where you can mm -hmm. write the name in, etch mm -hmm. the name in, everything else. It's a legit trophy. I'm in. And so we're excited about next year, as you can tell. Yep. I need the what we what you usually need, you need the head coach on board. You need their signature. Mm -hmm. You need the AD signature. Mm -hmm. I know Trev would be on board with this. He's got to play his game. And he said the right thing. He's like, Will, I know you respect. We got a lot of things going on right now. And I was like, hand up. Fully understand. Had to ask because the game's coming up. Yep. So that's why we asked the question: Are you willing to make this thing There's official? Photo right there. Wow. The forty-pound brass trophy. Love it. That's sitting in like recruits see it. And when they went to the game, because I know all of Nebraska is going to watch this. When we went to the game, even in their recruiting area. They had with the lights, you know the lights that you guys put in the Hawks to decorate all the big recruiting stuff. Bulb, big bulb, big bulb lights. Yeah. Saying bus and bowl the day it came. Playing the game. I know Nebraska could do well. Nebraska, I'm just letting you know that's what's happening behind this, enemy this is lines. Just factual. What do you know? Our legal team made up a contract right here. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so all you're gonna do is I write your name, and then you can read through it if you like. There's a lot of language here, but um, I would if you want to. Yes, sir. This is this is history. Hey, this is history. <laughs> this is fucking history, brother. Let's go. Oh wow! Well, is that a real signature? Yeah, that's, yeah. Oh, that was a lot of loops. I was just making sure that was a lot of loops. <laughs> All right, now. Taylor, I yeah. So when we were at the game, um. Oh yeah, there it is right there. The league, we're gonna need another signature. Oh shit, you're right. I think he's gonna dip on the boys. I don't think it's as important to him like it is, Coach Rule. But I think he's no, gonna... he's not dipping on the boys. He he said a statement. He's, he fully plans to be a part of the Michigan Wolverines in 2023. Yeah, what, a what a doctored statement right there by his agent. They wrote it, didn't they? <laughs> now twenty million dollars a year. He allegedly got offered by the Denver Broncos. Ooh, there's a lot of mutual interest. Money there. does talk, and I wouldn't be mad at him, but I'd be real. I, I would, I would cry because it's over. I wouldn't smile because it happened. Yeah, uh, which I know you're not supposed to do. Now, this um, that was huge. What you did there. That was. I think that, we're that was. Taking back. We're taking uh, back. Yeah, I, I might need a moment of silence real quick. Hey, can we get a moment of silence for the busable coach rule signing it? Thank you. That was big. They went hand to the heart. I didn't know what to do. Like, <laughs> we told the pledge. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh man. Hey, ain't that yeah. iconic? What an iconic. That was iconic, so man. This, this has been one of my favorite episodes. Thank you. Having you on all the time, all the truly. time, dude. We have a great time on this bus, but sometimes guys come on, and you're like kind of fishing, f trying to find things to talk about. But really, you've been great. You. You, you've spoken well. I think you've done yourself a service. These recruits that are probably watching this episode get to know get to know Matt Rule. Here you go. You have a, an hour and twenty one minutes plus happening. This flew by. This baby's not over yet. All of Nebraska will be tuned in. I'm sure you're probably aware. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they do go hard, man. They I, do go hard. The coolest thing about Nebraska is. I went there. I played there in 2013 because you were you were last year was 2012. Mm -hmm. I went there and no, that's the year we got our ass beat. It was 2012. Yeah, we me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah we got our ass beat. The stadium was rocking, extremely loud. Lights. The boys were playing well. Denard got hurt. That's why we lost. We probably could have won that game, but we ended up not winning that game. I ended up just getting absolutely piled pile dry for 60 minutes. After the game, there's fans that are kind of lined up as you're walking out. And they are the nicest. Hey, great job. Hey, you'll get them next time. You guys keep it up. Have a great rest of the season. A feeling you don't really get when you play football against opposing fan bases. Right. It was. An, it is you know, a very feeling, cool place. It's the greatest feeling in the world as a coach, though. You know the greatest thing you can ever say to someone mm. as a coach? You walk up after, after you've won. You walk up and say, hey, your boys played hard today. Oh, the greatest. The greatest. Oh, oh, yeah. uh, Joey Damn. McGuire, the head coach of Texas Tech, taught me that. And I just, whenever I can, you know, just that's the. I like the little grit. Yeah, your boys played hard today. Your boys played hard your today. Your boys played hard today. today. Do we want to do a uh, tear talk? Because I have one in my head that we could do. I know we talked about maybe possibly doing emojis. But just to keep the Nebraska theme, we could do our, tier, our top tier 
top three selling points of the University of Nebraska? Mm, see, sometimes I don't like when it's just centric on one thing. Because, because say you do emojis, it is the head coach, it's a little yeah, bit more fun. universal. We could have him list his top three things, selling points at Nebraska. And we can all rate it by one word. But it's almost like, it's almost like, yeah, that's true. And it would probably be basic because it's going to be education. But what, he, he's already said it. it's going to be. Is Nebraska a good uh, educational university? We have uh, the most academic All-Americans of any athletic department in the country, over 100 more than Stanford. What well, that might just be Nebraska just giving out good grades. That's, you can't. I'm just saying it could be. I'm over here. I'm now. I'm now on outside. I've I've walked outside the box. If Michigan wanted to, now they wouldn't because they're a top 15 public school in the entire world. We could just start dishing out A's to the boys. Now the whole team's academic all American. It's all sports at just across the athletic department. Hundred hundred more than Stanford. You're doing something. You're doing something. You're doing something. It's okay. You're doing something. You're doing something right. Tell them what N stands for. Nebraska. I can't do it. Knowledge. I can't do it. I knew. I knew the joke, but I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. You're like, oh, I'll let it come out. I'm proud that I got the joke. I feel like any other day, be like, oh, that's nice. That's he nice. said I can't do it. He said I can't do it. Uh, Dude. All right, we'll do emojis. So, uh, will do you want to explain our tear talk? So, tear talk is essentially. Are you familiar with tear talk? Since no, you've caught up on some episodes, yeah, yeah. so. Uh, Tier talk is essentially tier one, tier two, tier three. You can throw in an honorable mention if you'd like okay. to. Okay. Uh, but essentially your top three emojis. Our tier talk today for this episode is going to be emojis. Okay. Since you are basically the emoji king. I'm trying. Do we need to take a second? I kind of need to see exactly. I'm trying to figure out which avenue I want to go down. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? There's some fun stuff out there. There's some fun stuff out like, there. Am I trying to be unprofessional in front of Coach Rule? <laughs> Be, stay horny, my boy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <gosh>. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. All right. I think mine's going to be my honorable mention. Mm. Tip of the cap to the moon. The moon emoji. Oh. The dark moon emoji. I feel like when you throw that, if you add that to your bag and you throw that in there, it throws people off. Like, what does he even mean by that? But it's funny looking. You just randomly throw that in a conversation. I'm telling you, it's good. Add it to your bag, boys. My tier three is going to be the water. The mm. spots? Yeah. We got to stay hydrated out there. You got to stay hydrated out there. Keep that H2O up. My tier two, big, big vegetable guy, the eggplant. I like the eggplant. I'm going to go with the eggplant for my two. My tier one. This is this this emoji's been with me all time since since birth. The eyes. You shoot the eyes. The eyes are killer. That was, yeah. That it's was, all right. You can, I, you I can just keep it in my This okay. isn't a draft. All right, okay. This isn't okay, a draft. Okay, okay. Yeah. But eyes tier one. Eggplant, big vegetable guy. Tier two. Could be corn. You know, could be corn. Could be corn. Big big cob energy. That's a big thing we're all about on Saturdays at Memorial Stadium. Uh, but my tier and my tier three water. And tip of the cap, salute to the moon. I love, I love the little moon emoji. Like that's my, that's my tier, that's my tier talk. Now what we do is everybody goes around and gives a one word response to your tier talk. So we'll go around, you can go last. Respectable. True. Hard. Horny. <laughs> and I can't tell my mom to watch this now. No, right. <laughs> Devious. Oh. You know, I'm sorry. You know you're my boy, but can I, say, can I, I have to be honest? Yeah. yeah. A little too, uh, can, I, can I say two words or hyphenated? Yeah, you just say hyphenated if you say two. <laughs> hyphenated. Too clever. Well, too clever. Yeah. Mm. He's a clever boy. Yeah. Clever He's boy. Clever, clever boy. boy. Clever that that eggplant got real clever back in the day. The, the, <laughs> um, uh, respectable. Yeah, I really, I really enjoyed that. Uh, I'm shoot those three to my wife right now. <laughs> <laughs> my honorable mention. Uh, it's not used a lot, but when it is, it just means so much. That is the goat emoji. When you put out the goat emoji, you know we all know what that means, and that's just like Will said, a tip of the cap to whatever individual you might be referring to at that time. My tier three. Got to eat your vegetables. It's very important. This thing, since the dawning of its time, has really helped me send that Morse code out. Let, letting everybody know where I'm at. 
I need them vegetables. And that goes to the eggplant. My tier two is a new one that's been introduced to me, I would say, in the last six months. But I love it with a passion. That is the salute. Oh, uh, I think the salute is that's such an elite yeah. move, especially because it's half-faced. I oh. fucking think it's funny and it packs a punch, dude. I probably overuse it. And then my tier one has to go to them eyes. You trying to get so hey, especially if you're in a group chat. I do Will and I do it a lot. One of us will send a text. Maybe we don't get a response for that person and for a little bit. Other individual puts out the eyes. Like, hey, we're kind of waiting on you, bub. We're kind of just waiting on you right now. Are you gonna respond to this or no? It's light. It's lighthearted. It's lighthearted. And that are uh, that is my tier talk. Strong. Mm. Relatable. Jesus blast. Approved. Cosign. I, I was hoping you'd say horny again. <laughs> Solid. Thank you. Diabolical. <laughs> oh, all right, Coach, all right, coach Rule. Oh, man. All right, so. Who's um, the first coach who's, is it Partook? Partaken. Partaken. In the I like Partook talk. better than yeah, Partaken. Part He's the first coach to Partook in our tier talk. Mm. I didn't like it in the sentence, though. I kind of like the word by itself more than the sentence. My honorable mention is the uh, cloud of smoke. Oh, the you know, poof. The, yeah, the poof. Yeah. It's like you can use it in recruiting, like, hey, this dude's fast. You can, like, if, if, if you've been texting a recruit and he don't text you back, you're like, you vanished on me. Yeah. Like, there's a lot of things. Ooh, yeah, gosh. there's a lot of things. You usually late at night. <laughs> that's that's my, for us, though. That's my honorable mention. Um, gosh, I'm so scared what to say right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hey, if you don't, hey. <laughs> If you don't like it, we can no, always maneuver no, to something it, else. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. But I, I'm afraid there's gonna be like a like a, a there's a, like someone on Twitter is gonna translate what I really mean when I say why I use each one. Um, well, they're out there. Uh, uh, number three for me is the eyes. The eyes is elite. It's you guys. You guys covered it so well. So thank you for that. Number two is the half salute mm. because I didn't even know what it meant when I first when J C Horn sent it to me one time and I was like, what's that mean? I had yeah. to go look it up, like, like Urban Dictionary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What do you mean? Hey, why is it just half his face? Like, yeah, yeah. And that's that, the most, that's the biggest part about it. It's like, why is he hiding also? No and so I've, I've, going last is hard because you guys have taken all the good ones. My last one, and I use it a lot, is is just the brain explosion. You know, it's just half the face and the brain coming out like, man, you blew my mind. Like, no one? Dude, that is a dad emoji right that there. I love that. One. I love that you said that. You pull and that one up, I don't think I've seen it. it. Yeah. And he's the way he's explaining Oh, that one. Yes. Oh, your mind's blown. Yeah. My mind's blown. Like, oh, like, like, yeah. Me, like that, that, that has so many different meanings. Um, my, that's my deal. That's your deal. Oh, oh, you. Mind blown. Mind blown. Yeah. Like, ah, there you go. One word. I'm not ready. Me either. Boss. Strong. Boomer. <laughs> Solid. He's good. He's getting initiated. Yeah. Legend. This is this is hyphenated king shit. <laughs> okay, Mitch. All right, Mitch. Husked. Husked. <laughs> Dad. Dad. Hey, that was you did a really good job. You did. Know, you that did. was outstanding. It was hard to go last. It was hard to go last. Yeah, and I feel like we probably should let people go second after they see how it's done. Like one of us goes first. Yeah. But I thought, yeah, I thought that was that was a good job. I love watching the conviction of him talking to us about the mind blown emoji. Yeah, the cloud <laughs> of the cloud of smoke too. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. He was looking at me, telling me, "I go." <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, is your son gonna watch this? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Is he a Bussin fan? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Right, well, that's yeah. the right answer. That's Gotta right respect answer. that, dude. He's about, oh, shit, my I, dad I told him I, I told him I was gonna be on here today, so he was pretty fired up. So that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. it'll come out next week. It was, it's a good move. I think it's a good move. What coming on here? Yeah, why not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. of course it is. Because we're not going to let other coaches do it. We're going to, we, you know, Michigan. I mean, we could let other coaches come on. Yeah, we'll probably. I mean, probably any coach that wants to come on, we'll probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we, 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 have, we, we have, have anything else. Any questions want to talk for about? the boys in the back? I've got one question. Let's Love go, it. Jack. So, you can always count on Jackie Boy. In 2026, Nebraska has scheduled a non-conference game that will be taking place in Lincoln, and it's against the Tennessee Volunteers. I would just like to know what your game plan is so we can be ready in three years. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
repeat the Orange Bowl. But, but realistically, I'm because Will obviously big husk here. I went to Tennessee. I'm a big Vols fan, and I'm really excited for that game, even though it's three years away because we don't get to have the same competitive nature that Will and Taylor do with Nebraska and Michigan or how me and Garrett do with Alabama and Tennessee. So I'm excited to see some Big Ten SEC matchups. Um, I guess like a realistic question is with you being new there and Josh Heupel um, just coming in within the last two years, You do you think you're going to be on the same page that how Josh has taken Tennessee? Not in the same necessarily ballpark and like in terms of success, but uh, where am I going with this? We're going 11-1 and one into the Orange Bowl, brother, is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. How, how do you plan on getting your guys to buy in the way Heupel's gotten his guys to buy in in the last That's a good way years? to round it out, Jack. I, I, first of all, I'll say this. I think, I think Josh has done a great job. He really has. Um, you know what? I, uh, I don't try to get guys to buy in. Um, I just try to do what we do and hope. I'm sorry. I try to do what we do and hope, hope that they uh, believe in it. Um, but I do think the, the, these, the, the guys at Nebraska are hungry to win. They want to win. It's not one of those deals where it's like, well, I mean, who's this guy? That, hopefully, uh, you know, they, they believe in what we're going to do. And um, I, I didn't come to lose. I'll say that much. I, that, I did not come to lose. I got one. 2026, before you go, but 2026? Yeah. I think it's September 12th. That's on some Oscar. I don't know if they have <laughs> we came to chew bubble gum and beat ass, and we're all out of bubble gum, brother. That's what's happening hey, September twelfth, um, the twenty six. <laughs> the the tweet you sent yesterday about uh, Hypel was that from Eckler? I don't know. Oh, I might have seemed to re- receive a similar text. Yeah, I don't know. That's out there in the stars. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's in the cloud. I was. I don't know if I was a vessel or I came up with that on my own. <laughs> all right bro you know what i mean yeah i'm sorry you had to be a part of that that was that was a uh, i probably could have waited till after the podcast <laughs> <laughs> all right mitchy what's your question bob um so you're from state college pa mm-hmm. uh what was it like playing under joe pa it was awesome um you know I, one thing about coach paterno was he, he uh he like like he was you know he was a little bit older when i got there he had so much energy at practice like you could not you could not not go hard, and he held the the best players the most accountable. Like a lot of a lot of coaches, like they'll they'll crush the walk ons and they let the best players do what they want. Not Joe. Like he was going to hold our best players the most accountable. So a guy like me that was just like, I was like, if he's going to do that to Kyle Brady or Kachana Carter, I better stay. And I think that 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 meant a lot to me. I learned a lot from him. Um, and he was a man. He was a man, he was a maniac in a good way at practice. Man, he would run around, and I mean, when I was on the scout team. I was on the scout team, and I forget it was Curtis Ennis or whoever, like, was injured. So he had a green jersey, which means don't touch him. He can practice, but don't touch him. So I run up. They throw him the ball. I run up. I break up. I jump out of the way. And he comes running over, and he's like, what are you doing? Like, let's practice. You got to hit him. And I didn't know what to do because I not to talk back to my coach. I said, but coach, he has a green jersey on. And coach lost it. He's like, what do you mean a green jersey? He's like, I don't care if you're hurt. You got to be out here practicing. And he all of a sudden, he walks away like eight feet. He turns around. And he goes, he goes. Oh, he had the green jersey on. Good job, rule. Good job. Oh no, no like, shit. It didn't matter that it was me. He's like, oh, he. I oh, got you. So, but he was awesome. I love the man. And like he, he, um, like you know, he, he, we, we won, but we won. All of our guys got degrees and got educations and went on and had good lives. So it was pretty cool. G. I don't really have a question, but. From our previous experiences in Lincoln, it's always been a good time. And I think, like, I can agree with what Taylor's saying. Like, you got a good energy. Like, I'm fired up to come to Lincoln this year. Yeah, that's going to be a fun spring football tour this year. Like, it's going to be rocking. It already is mm-hmm. rocking, but, like, yeah. Come Matt through. Rule fan for sure. Oh, we'll <laughs> be there. We will absolutely be there. You'll be, on the, you'll be on again, except we'll be in your house. Let's do it. Yeah. It'll be awesome. I've already told Ionitis he's a Husker now. He's an honorable Husker. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, oh, and you got to coach Amir, too. Oh, yeah. Amir. Dude, how much of a stud is he? Amir, Amir. Amir. So we did those Thursday night dinners. So Amir came over with the running backs. And the next week I had the receivers over. And Amir came over again. He's like, no. <laughs> Just go pet the dog and hang out. Like, I love. Like, when he when he left, he gave me a book. And um, just his kind of guy he is, right? Thoughtful. He just gave me a book that he thought I would like. I just, I mean, he's a true pro. And when I got this job, I called him. I was like, hey, right before I took the job, I was like, Hey, gonna, my, my, you have some questions here in, in, in a day or two, and then I took the job, and he's been unbelievable. Dude, he's, he's the best man. He's a stud. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He really yeah, is. He's a, a big stud. Too. 
Yeah. Um, I don't think I have anything else. Do you? No, I, 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 I am. Trying to think. Greatly appreciate you coming on this podcast. Fired up to I be. know you're super busy, so it was awesome to have you yeah, on. Man, this, was, this was like legit awesome. Thank you. You, yeah, yeah. When I when you shot the text, I was fired up. Hit the boys right away. But yeah, this has been incredible. This has been incredible. I'm trying to like, cause you know your boys and your boys and some uh, That's huge too. Your boys in some player group chats of the Huskers. I'm trying to think if there's anything that the boys would want me to ask. I don't think so. I'm fired up that T Knight's there. Yeah. He's probably heard me going some spiels in the locker room back in Washington <laughs> about black shirts and what, what happened this week and that week. He better not, hey, Pot Roast, you better not be talking to kids about losing weight now. Because I remember your couple, your last years in Washington oh. talking about he wouldn't get on the scale, talking about, oh, his budget's changed. <laughs> That's the <laughs> night. Oh. Yeah, yeah Pot Roast. Bro, yeah, Pot was, Roast was the best. I man. was his position coach. His, when, I, when I first went to Temple, his sophomore year, I was the D-line coach. And that whole first week I had him, he had like done something wrong in school, and I showed up. Whole first week, every morning at 6 a.m., him and me, like, just, that's how our relationship started. So now we're sitting there, like, in an academic talk, talking to somebody. I'm like, who are you talking to, bro? Yeah. <laughs> but, no, he's 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 a wonderful person, like, and, and uh, you know, he played at 295 that year. I made, I, I had to keep him under 300. And he, he's not, he, he didn't play at 295 in the league. He did not keep him, yeah, under 300 pounds at Washington. <laughs> what was he weighing at Washington? Oh, I don't know, but we had to get him. I think we called it gap, gas, but we had to gap him. To the side of the tilt, like you know the uh, the YU pair. Yeah, we'd we'd have to gap him to get going because you know you're you're uh, anticipating stretch just to get him going so he wouldn't get cut off. Those are the best players to play against. Yeah, yeah. but he was a stud. I mean, he made a lot of money, yeah. especially in Denver. He won a Super Bowl. Like he was a stud. He's all state receiver. No shit. He was a receiver Same. in high school. Grew into a tight end. <laughs> Legit, but I wasn't like I was, was going to bring that up. I was just trying to be funny. bring that up for you. <laughs> Oh, it's so funny. But no, um, no shit for real. He was a receiver, turned tight end, and when I got there, he was a D lineman and then then he became pot roast. So Yeah, man, he yeah. did become pot roast. He was in the, I think it was like Bridgestone Tire commercial. Oh, oh, Is it, that the, oh, yeah, he, you said he'll that break it. He'll, no, he'll, he has it on his phone. Like things like, oh, you're talking about this? I happen yeah. to have it right here. Boom, here's my hilarious. commercial. I, I, I go ahead. I was gonna ask, where were you at in two thousand eight? Two thousand and eight. I would have been at Western Carolina University. In, no, 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 no. I was at Temple University as an assistant coach. Hmm. As an assistant. Did you get offered by Temple? Mm-mm. No, neither did I. <laughs> they recruit us. You guys, they recruit y'all? You know, I uh, remember uh, the Panthers offered to fly me in last year, year mm-hmm. nine. Do you remember that? If only, if, yeah, yes, but if, on, if only I would have been there a little longer this year, we could have made something happen. Yeah, yeah. Well, did you think to bring Will Compton in again? You know what I, I I was I, I was running for my life at that point. There was I was too. Yeah. <laughs> no I, I was on borrowed time. I you guys ended up bringing in um, Ravens linebacker. He played at Ravens for a while. Josh Bynes. Josh or, Bynes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You guys him. ended up bringing him in because uh, Perryman got traded. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, man, I I do have a question. Group chat was blowing up a little bit when they saw the wide receiver coach hire. How do you get a wide receiver coach being PC? To sell the next guy who wants to be the next Julio Jones in a living room, him be the co- him be the wide receiver coach in that room, corral a room, mainly of athletes, huh? being PC, staying PC. You're a wide receiver coach hire. I'm assuming we're talking. This coach is pale. He's yeah. He's he's a little pale. He's on the pale side. The, the some small people, some people, smaller pale side. Some, some people have, like he's 23, 24. Some people say like, why would you know? Young, yes, yeah. young too. And like I I think. Um, I think he's probably one of the best football minds I've ever been around. I think I'll be I'll struggle to keep him for three or four years. Like I, he could have stayed in the NFL. It's just his loyalty to me that he would even leave the NFL. He they, they, he he could have stayed for multiple pieces. I think he's I think he's gonna be I think he's gonna be brilliant. And you know for me, the 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 program will you know I'll I'll run the overall program. Like you know like there's we. The players are going to be loved, and but they're they're also going to you know we, we have standards. They're all everybody's going to do it. They're you're 18, 19, 20, 21. There's going to be ups and downs, and I'm low key about that. But we really want guys who want to be pros, and we really want guys who want to be good players. And so, to me, what I've learned over time is like, you know, sometimes people think oh, I should go play for him because he played in the league this long. I should go play for this. At the end of the day, either the coach can help you be better, or he can. You know what I'm saying? Like mm-hmm. if. if if like when I went to be the assistant online coach of the Giants, I'd never. I'm not an old lineman. How could I help? Well, I could. I could break down every move that Geno Atkins had done, and I could go to these guys who were all pros and be like, "Hey, look, I, I broke down 200 snaps. Here's what I got." Da, da, da. I found a way to create value for myself. So, to me, the best coaches are the ones who can help you be a good player. And so, when you've when you've coached in the NFL and now you come back to college, 
I just think he's, I think he and some of the other guys I hired are young guys. I think they're brilliant. I just, I got tired of hiring coaches with big names who didn't really want to put the work in. You know what I'm saying? Like, I got tired of hiring coaches who have like their own personal brand. Like, I want guys who are in it for the players. As a player, I believe you can feel whether the coach is in it for you or not. And so, if a player doesn't want that, then he's probably not right for us. But, um, yeah, I've had a lot of people say that to me. And I honestly, can I tell you how I really feel? I'm kind of like, you guys brought me here because you're not winning. So why are, you, why are you worried about what I'm doing? Just let me do it. Like, mm -hmm. like wait three years and then, but sometimes, you know, there's so much interest. You're going to kind of be into it a lot. Like, like I believe we're going to win and I believe we're going to win doing it this way. You know, as I go, I'll adapt and learn. And I don't know Nebraska yet, but the smartest thing hopefully that I can do is, is put the right people in the building. And uh, Garrett, I think is, I'm telling you, I think he's going to be a, I think he's going to be a head coach someday. And so, like Evan Cooper, my DB coach, I've, I've had him with me forever. Some of the top coaches in football, like Fran Brown's a DB coach at Georgia. Like I gave him his first job. Elijah Robinson's a D-line coach at A&M. He's making $1.2 million to be the D-line coach. Everyone tries to hire him as their DC. Like I hired him as from a player development guy. So I've always hired young people that I think that guy's going to be special. And I watch them take off. And um, I, th I think that's what Garrett will do. Mm. Coach, I appreciate you coming on. Yeah, you've been fucking awesome. For real. Thank you a lot. Outstanding. I don't think we have anything else, boys. Hey, subscribe. We hope you love this. Nebraska, drop the B, drop the GBR, or also the uh, Big Cobb Energy in the chat, all that stuff. Coach Rule, you've been phenomenal. Phenomenal. Thank you. Big hugs, tiny kisses. Mm.